John, wouldn't you say that what we're dependent on we call reality, and what we don't like we consider an intrusion in our life? Consequently, I feel that what's happening is that we're continually being intruded upon. That would make us very unhappy. Mm -hmm. Or we surrender to it and call it culture. Call it culture? Or whatever. Give me an example. What, what, what would be an intrusion on your life, for instance, that you would call culture? Well, uh, this weekend I was, I was on the beach. Yes. And on the beach these days are uh, transistor radios. Yes. Blaring out rock and roll. Yes. All over. Yes. And you didn't enjoy it? Not particularly. I adjusted to it. How? By saying that, well, I, I thought of the sun and the sea as a lesser evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know how I did, adjusted to that problem of the radio in the environment. Very much as the uh, primitive people adjusted to the animals which frightened them and which probably, as you say, were intrusions. They made, drew pictures of them hmm? on their caves. And so I simply made a piece using radios. Now, whenever I hear radios, even a single one, not just 12 at a time, as you must have heard on the beach, at least, I think, well, they're just playing my piece. <laughs> <laughs> That might help me next weekend. Yeah, and I listen to it with pleasure. Uh, by, by pleasure, I mean uh, I notice what happens. I can attend to it rather than, uh, as you say, surrender. I can rather pay attention and become interested in the... Um, well, what it, what it actually is that you're interested in is what superimposes what. What happens at the same time, together with what happens before and what happens after. Yes, but I can't think unless thought is something of the past. Uh, the other night I met some friends in a place which I was very nostalgic about. I used to go there and talk a lot. No one could hear each other. Because of this? Because of this. Yeah. Well, uh, this, this brings up the remark of Satie's that uh, what we need is a music which will um, not interrupt the noises of the environment. Hmm? In other words, we might then need thoughts uh, which would not uh, impose upon the transistorized <laughs> radios. <laughs> All I'm trying to say is that this is a coin which has two sides and that the, um, say you think of your thoughts as the reality, or your conversation at least, that you wish to have as a reality and the environment is an in intrusion, then that sati remark just takes that coin, turns it over and says the reality is the environment, what you want to do in it is an intrusion. And finally, the work of an artist, for instance, is it not an, an incisive intrusion? Hmm? Because for heaven's sake, it didn't exist until the artist does it. Hmm? Yes, I never heard anybody really boo a transistor radio. <laughs> I think, well, you have just now, in a sense, and I, uh, I have done it. 
formerly, when I would go into any friend's home, um, out of deference, you know, to my tastes, uh, seeing me coming, they simply turned off all the, um, any radio that was, or even a disc that happened to be playing at the time. Now they no longer do it. They know that I think that I composed all those things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a problem for me. I feel that I'm quite at odds with it. Well, maybe I like... Maybe actually I really like things to... Uh, for example, if I'm standing in front of a jet and I hear the blaring sound, I don't feel annoyed because I know it's going to take me someplace. Yeah. Or that it's bringing some friends. The noise is utilitarian. <laughs> <coughs> and it almost dramatizes the flight, you know. Yeah. But, but that then is not an intrusion, really. That's a, that's a sound which, because of other things you're doing, you must um, carry along, as it were, with you, with your experience at any rate. What would you say to giving a concert of your works in an architectural situation where something else that was going on was um, at least partly audible at the same time. Let's imagine, just to make the conversation consistent, that the um, um, concert is in a room and that one door from that room is open, and in the room upon which it opens, um, radio music is audible. Now, must that door be closed, or may it be left open? I would like the door to be left open, but without the radio. <laughs> you see, I want to leave the door open, but of course. Well, all we have to do to know that that in that room, if the door is open, all we have to do to know that there is something in that room that that if we are exercising our um, choices, we will know that in that room is something we don't desire if if we are living with our desires or our choices. And the only only thing that the simplest thing you can do to find out that that's the case is simply to pick up a newspaper because the things that are happening are not things that you would have chosen in your right mind to have happen in the world in that room. Now, years ago, the radio was blaring. I think that there was just uh, as many intrusions as there are today, but I didn't hear them. Today I hear them. So there must be something there that seems to be competing with me. Or let's put it this way, that my old role has been uh, weakened psychologically. Well, what was your role? The old-fashioned role of the artist, deep in thought. Well, this is certainly changing, I think. And um, Since, since it's perfectly clear that you're a magnificent artist in that role of being deep in thought, hmm, what I would like to see is how magnificent you are intruded upon. What do you think of that idea? Do you recall, I, isn't this true that once when we had one of those conversations we so... Um, uh, I'm sure each of us so remembers walking through the streets of Lower East Side and the village and whatnot, 
until late hours at night. Um, I think I expressed once the idea that that you had discovered a, a world, a musical world, because it was your music, really, that opened up uh, everything, your piece, the, uh, uh, what was it called, the one for, I think the first one was for piano. Projection. Projection, yes, and, and you wrote it uh, down at Monroe Street, and David Tudor and I were in the other room, and you left us, and you wrote this piece on graph, giving us this um, freedom of playing in those three ranges, high, middle, and low. And um, then we went in and played the piece, and it was then that the, the musical world changed. Now, not just the musical world outside of you, but the musical world inside of you, hmm? in this role that you speak of, deep in thought. Nevertheless, the thing I think I said to you once on that walk through the night is now that you have opened up this world, let us see all the things that are in it. Now, among the things that are in that world is this situation of granted someone deep in thought his being intruded upon. Yes, but that's become the image. Hmm? That's become the image. No, there are many images now, I would say. I think there are... I don't think we can count them any longer. I mean, for myself. I mean, it's become very the predominant one. Yeah. Of someone who is thinking and always interrupted. Mm. Yes. In this thinking. Yes. Which, uh, of course, is a, always a marvelous thing because you begin to see that what you're thinking about isn't that important to begin with. Yes. I always found there's something a little too pretentious about thought to begin with. Also, there's... Also, any given thought has an enormous um, potential. It's a, it, it gets into our heads and won't go out for years and years and years. At the same time, I mean, just uh, simply <laughs> stated, I can't conceive of some brat turning on a transistor radio in my face and say, ah, the environment. But all that radio is, uh, Marty, is uh, making available to your ears what was already in the air and uh, approach and available to your ears, but you couldn't hear it. In other words, all it is is making audible something that you're already in. You are bathed in radio waves, TV broadcasts, probably telepathic messages hmm? from other minds deep in thought. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to the radio at the same time. <laughs> and this radio simply makes audible something that, that you thought was inaudible. Now, you know, most painters I know, they all listen to music when they work. You know, Franz Klein loved Wagner. He yeah, used to listen to Wagner. Uh, David Tudor, when he practices, uh, which he does so rarely now, but when any time he does practice, he immediately turns on not one, but several radios, and often a TV set at the same time. Uh, you might compare it with the tantric Buddhist uh, discipline. You know, the, you know of those disciplines? No to meditate while sitting on a corpse or in the course of sexual intercourse. In other words, to make the, the situation in which you're deep in thought a really difficult one in which to be in thought. Hmm? Now, what happens there? There, there is obviously an intrusion uh, against which the... Um, 
at least we imagine, the uh, person in meditation steals himself. Hmm? Now, does he or doesn't he? We won't know, because what would enlightenment be in that case? Would it be being blind to your environment, or would it be um, being quite aware of it and at the same time deep in thought? Hmm? Yes. I know what's happening, though. I know what's happening for myself. Where 15 years ago, where the perspective of the sound in the piece, even though it did try, and I did try, to embrace that which would cast a shadow on my work. Many of my pieces I wrote almost Actually, I remember once I even wrote a piece just trying to capture the pulsating of the tires going in the rain on the drive. But it was all still distant. It was on the outer edges, so to speak, of the piece. And now what is happening is that the focus is different. I find myself right on top of all the things which uh, in the past I found Unesthetical. Now, I still find it unesthetical, but I'm on top of it. So a journey was made. I certainly don't want to then make the leap, wherever this leap will be, into a situation where, uh, not unlike uh, a car ride I was in with Larry Rivers and we passed a garbage dump. And he says, you know, uh, a little grapefruit on the left would just give it a nice color. You know, I've had similar drives through the country on our tours with Bob Rauschenberg, where he'd see the sunset or something and criticize it, you know, and <laughs> suggest that the colors be different and the trees in different positions. But that, it, like humor, hmm? What was it with Larry? Was it humor or was it... Uh, well, with Larry, I think Larry was worried. That this color was absent, you mean? No, not that the color was absent, but uh, he was uh, he wasn't raving against um, junk sculpture or um, a garbage collage. But uh, he was afraid that if he himself made the leap, is that he'll start to see this new thing in the kind of some type of an, uh, an aesthetic judgment. Yeah. Almost juxtapose a, 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 a an observation he would make about Cezanne, yeah. and juxtapose it in relation to a garbage heap, you know. Yeah. You remember that one of those concerts at Town Hall that we around the late forties or early fifties, uh, when the painters were still going to the concerts, and, mm -hmm. and when we spoke of the Renaissance of new music and so forth, Varese was beginning to be played again. Um, I got, after the concert, I got in the blue ribbon at a table where Bill de Kooning was. And I don't think I heard all of the conversation, but it was clear that they were talking about the way the crumbs had fallen on the, on the tablecloth. And Bill was discussing whether or not this was art. Hmm? And he was uh, concluding, of course, that it wasn't. Hmm? But then that was, um, a difference that had already appeared between myself and Bill. I remember his saying once to me, the um, difference between us is that I want to be a great artist, and you don't. Was he wrong? No, I think he's absolutely right. <laughs> you mean if you want to be a great artist, you have to turn off the radio? Or you well, feel that's no, part of it? No, no. I, th I don't know any longer um, what... Uh, I really don't know what being an artist is. I think that the... Uh, 
I have difficulty with the notion of roles. In other words, I don't want to play a role. I want to be, um, be so to speak, uh, what I am. Uh, if I am playing a role, I want to play it all the time. If I'm not playing a role, I don't want to play a role. Hmm? But what it was to be a composer doesn't seem to me any longer to be what it is now to be a composer, and I don't know what it is to be a composer now. Unless... I don't even know what it was to be a composer. Well, you said earlier, and I'm agreeing with you, and I, I remember doing it, it was being deep in thought. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's all I'm left with. I feel if this thought yeah. was taken away from me, yeah. that's it. Yeah. No, but there could be another way to be a composer, surely. There could at least be uh, this one we've already mentioned, someone deep in thought who is constantly interrupted. Hmm? Or, like there, Bach. or there could be what I've suggested, I think, in my, some of my work, um, someone who um, doesn't have any thoughts. And so uh, is, uh, can't be said to be either shallow or deep. Hmm? And who simply uh, sets something going that... Uh, either has sounds in it or doesn't have sounds in it that enables uh, uh, not only other people but himself too to um, uh, experience. I guess in my case that it goes out of thought into um, experience. This was certainly um, one of the things that showed up when the, when the uh, Frenchman, headed by Boulez, began to object to my work and ideas, they objected to the notion that music was made of sound. Yes, I always thought that was extraordinary. It was like the medical profession objecting to the fact that some of I said that they should wash their hands when they perform an operation. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think, I think one of the things that has happened is that it's become clear that we, we can be not just with our minds, but with our whole being um, responsive to sound. And that that sound doesn't have to be uh, the communication of, of uh, some deep thought. It can be just a sound. Now, that sound could go in one ear and out the other. Or it could go in one ear, uh, permeate the being, hmm? <laughs> transform the being, and then perhaps go out, letting the next one in. <laughs> <laughs> and then whether or not an idea developed. You know, the hardest thing in the world, of course, is to have a head without any ideas in it. But that's always the best work, you know? Always was. Yeah. That's perhaps what you mean by deep in thought. Oh, no, no. Uh, many times, I mean, my, if I'm in deep in thought, it's just to get rid of the ideas. Exactly, exactly. To get to the point where the... To get to that, I don't know what you would call it. You might get, call it an ocean. Hmm? To get to that... Uh, for me, it almost, it becomes almost like a, a physical stamina yeah. to just go on with an empty head. That, that, yeah. That's what I mean by being it, deep it, in it, thought. Yeah, if it's like an ocean with fish in it, and the fish are thoughts that you've gotten to the point where the, the view is so uh, full of the ocean that you don't um, notice the fish, hmm? Yes, it sounds like my new piece. <laughs> but maybe I don't want the ripples to come in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But does it matter? You mean the ripples? Or what do you mean? We expect them. Well, as a matter of fact, we couldn't live without them. Hmm? Back to impermanence. Or the ocean couldn't live without them. Hmm? 
Ocean wouldn't be ocean without them. I'm just reading um, a thing I got in the mail from a behavioral psychologist at La Jolla in California, Richard Farson. And he said, um, he says near the beginning of it, that um, we used to um, settle down, say, in some change that we made. And there would be a period uh, when we could, so to speak, adjust to this change. But that it, it becomes evident that we are going to be living in, um, in a situation which is, so to speak, change itself. He has all, one very interesting remark in that article, too, to support his thought. Something like 90% of the scientists who ever lived on this globe are now living. Isn't that interesting? You mean that there was such an influx of scientists? This is what we're living in, is a period um, in which uh, changes brought about by this activity of research and technology and so forth is producing, um, well, those transistorized radios, etc. Hmm? Oh, then one almost could say that 90% of the artists are no longer living. Of those deep in thought, probably. Yes. You know, I had certainly this feeling when I I was asked by the Kenyan Review to re review the Schoenberg letters, you know. I don't know if you read them. Yes, the I read them, too. But reading that book, um, and I, I uh, worship Schoenberg, and reading the book brought back that feeling of awe and so forth. He, he appears in his writings and in his mind and everything to, to be... Um, I tried to think of anyone else like him now. Hmm? And um, there is, I couldn't. The, the the closest I could come to it, say, was Stefan Volpe. Hmm? Uh, there's a little bit of it, but quite different in, in Caroline Stockhausen. Hmm? Uh, then again, outside the field of music, in painting, uh, the question arose recently of, of re-establishing Black Mountain College. And it was clear to anyone who knew Black Mountain that, that it depended upon the personality of Joseph Albers and he's no longer available for such a post. Well, who could take his place, hmm? And uh, you just don't know of anyone like that. They don't, uh, as you say, they don't live anymore. <laughs> what happened? Another question um, um, we could ask is, when did it happen, hmm? And, and we don't really know the answers to any of these questions. We'd say, well, maybe it happened toward the late end of the 50s, or maybe it happened in the 60s. <laughs> and furthermore, there was a difference, an essential difference, between um, uh, Schoenberg and Joseph Albers already. I would say from those letters and from my experience of Schoenberg that he was... Uh, Black Mountain would not have been Black Mountain under his direction because Albers already introduced into the um, life of Black Mountain College an enormous amount of permissiveness. But he was able, on occasion, to draw that whole thing together into a kind of a German image where everyone would click his heels and stand at attention and took him seriously. Hmm? And then when he unclicked his heels, they all went back to not attending their classes and, and doing whatever rendered their minds, graduating or not graduating. Schoenberg would never have, have permitted that kind of situation. Yet, Black Mountain was a glorious situation, so much so that one would like to revive it. And one doubts whether one would want to revive Schoenberg's own image of a school. You know, in his letters toward the end, they wanted him to establish a school in Israel. Yes. And he spoke of it as um, 
the graduates from this school would be priests, hmm? <laughs> and it was it was it would have been a, a quasi religious situation with no one smiling, ever. How can you smile if you're deep in thought? <laughs> But what's the need for Black Mountain when this whole permissiveness seems to be like one vast Black Mountain? Well, it must be that what they want in reestablishing Black Mountain is the discipline side of it, hmm? the clicking of the heels part of it. <laughs> you mean this uh, permissiveness is not getting anywhere? <laughs> not that, but uh, people have not found out how to um, assume this permissiveness as a, you know, as a responsibility. Or they would like that, something like that, I think, to happen. Maybe I'm wrong. Unfortunately, with permissiveness, there usually comes a very quick type of boredom. Boredom is not so bad. And not really boring, you know. This is something I've known all along from Zen Buddhism. You know that story. Uh, if something's boring after two minutes, try it yes. for four. After four, try it for eight, etc. You eventually find it isn't boring. People are constantly complaining. Almost every day somebody tells me that, that um, things are boring. Uh, things aren't boring. Our music isn't boring. Uh, it's just that... Uh, the um, people manage somehow not with these things that they say are boring not to get with them once they get with them then uh, boredom's the last thing that enters their minds however even while it's boring I would say that it's um, um, something to be uh, valued and experienced haven't you noticed that when your work gets really boring, as when um, you're copying out something that you uh, mm -hmm. d had written, you know, it's at that moment that ideas begin to fly into your head. When you're really um, bored, it, it, it brings you uh, closer and closer to the actual experience of, say, that ocean we were talking about in which some other fish than you had ever encountered might suddenly appear, hmm? And eat up all the other fish. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but then, who can speak of boredom nowadays, really? Who has his eyes or ears in the least little bit open? The only one who can speak of boredom is the one who, who isn't really paying attention to, to what's happening. I found recently that uh, any old newspaper lying around was um, on page after page um, having ideas which were pertinent, relevant to the ones that I was having. And so of, of um, quite outside the, uh, you know, the realm of, of being boring, they were so to speak, um, uh, reinforcing um, like they're doing now up in the sky um, with that um, Gemini and what do they call it, Aegina and so on, mm -hmm. giving further um, power, you know, to go to greater heights. And this power comes now from almost anything around us, I think. Would you teach music I mean if someone came to you and asked to study well just as I you see if I have problems now they're first of all problems about how to continue my work as I travel around we talked about that yes now say I solved that problem and could carry my work with me and, and do it in odd moments if I had a student, formerly I would have said that the first obligation of the teacher is to be present when the student is present. Hmm? 
Now, if I'm going to be traveling around, uh, I certainly don't want all those students traveling around with me. <laughs> and so I don't feel really in a position of teaching unless I'm with them. Now, this may mean that our notion of, of what it is to be with people has to change. Hmm? It may be that we can be with people, but at the same time at a distance. No, I think we can. Uh, uh. Yes, that was always very interesting. One never considered years ago having students as an intrusion. I remember, well, Schoenberg was incessantly teaching. Yes. It appeared that he preferred it to composition, hmm? almost. He was extraordinarily generous with his uh, time, ideas, and, and this teach this faculty that he had, which is grand for, for teaching, combined with terror and... Fuller, uh, Buckminster Fuller says that, and so does McLuhan, I think, that in, um, and now Farson, this one I mentioned, um, says that the whole business of the, of the society we're moving into is going to be education. They all seem to agree that the least important element in that educational life will be the teacher. If the teacher has anything to say, he will say it on some kind of recording device with images and so forth, TV. If anyone ever wants to hear it, they'll simply push a button and hear it. He will not be in the position, as teachers formerly were, of having to repeat himself, hmm? year after year. <laughs> he will simply do it once, and then he himself will become a student, hmm? along with the other students, and try to discover what it is that uh, his mind, his interests, and so forth can do, rather than just repeating. And you'd be astonished going around the country uh, seeing how much TV has already entered into the, you know, the educational um, business. It's, it's certainly true that if education is what we will do, it's going to be, have to be far more interesting than it has been. It would have to be well, I don't know what it would have to be. It would have to give a great deal more um, confidence to the students themselves to do um, their own work. Well, I don't think that'll ever be adapted in the music departments. Well, I think they're going to change. You know, there was a terrifying story. We were at a famous school, and at a famous seminar, graduate seminar, a young composer brought this piece in, and um, his teacher, a world-renowned composer, uh, told him to change it. And the student said, who wasn't really a student, he was a young composer, said, but I hear it this way. And his teacher said, you are here to change your hearing. Mm. Who, who was, did you say who that was? No, I didn't. You didn't. It's very curious. Uh, it could, you know, if I knew the circumstances, I'd know whether I went on one side or the other. I'd say whether I agreed with the teacher. Certainly one doesn't want a fixed way of hearing. either the one or the other. I'd like to have my ears so I could hear what there was to hear. <laughs> It seems that in Brazil, the, the government changes so frequently and nevertheless is the only source from which there can be uh, economic support for music.
that if the government is favorable at a moment, then you can almost immediately give a festival of, say, modern music. And you can't plan it very far in advance because by that time the government could very well have changed. So I saw the Carvalho's about oh, a matter of a month ago. And when I returned recently from Colorado, there was a letter saying um, that they would have a festival in Rio and, and Sao Paulo early in September, if I would come. I think they can surely have it without me. I didn't want to go because it seems to me that one of the dangers that exists in may exist more and more is that once you pass the point of interesting people in what you're doing and they become interested, then what they want is not anything new from you, but rather what you have done before. Hmm? So that you could be kept busy week after week, never having a chance to do anything but fulfill engagements, answer the telephone, and answer your correspondence. I remember speaking to Suzuki in um, Japan a few years ago about this question. He said it exists even in the field of philosophy. <laughs> that philosophers who, who become of interest to uh, a public are required uh, to uh, give so many lectures and classes and write books, answer questions and so forth, that they have no time to think. It's almost as if one was destined to stop thinking at a at a at not, perhaps in terms of our own level, but on others. Yes. If they step in, all right, you thought enough. <laughs> and you begin to feel, especially as one becomes famous, celebrated, you begin to feel, yes, I have thought enough. Well, I must say that Approaching as I am right now, this festival of art and technology in, in Stockholm. Offhand, this would appear to be, and I imagine it certainly would have appeared to me 10, 20 years ago, as a great opportunity. Not an opportunity to do something which I had already done, but an opportunity to do something that I had not yet done. Or as I find as I get closer and closer to it, that there is a resistance in me to have a new idea for an occasion. If I have a new idea, I would like it to be somehow free of occasion, hmm? free of this um, Well, I remember years ago, Marty, that we spoke about freedom and you explained to me very clearly with that beautiful story about um, the birds that there is no such thing as freedom. You remember that you... Maybe with the birds. You studied always... the birds and you saw they were all grabbing for scraps of food. Mm -hmm. Yes. We do believe, though, that the... that though there are controls in our life, as for instance with the birds that need to eat, that those controls could be in other places than they presently are. Hmm? I mean, you find, I found recently, when I was in England, that you become a victim of your own, uh, you know, of all the stories told about you, true or false. Mm. I was in some pub and the young composer came over to me and he said to me, uh, would you like a ginger ale, Mr. Feldman? And he said, hey, evidently that I love ginger ale. I didn't want ginger ale. <laughs> that particular, you know. <coughs> I was in England for the first time. I wanted something else. I didn't want ginger ale. And I said, yes, thank you. I didn't want to hide his feelings. Mm. But even on the musical and the whole aesthetical uh, area of one's life, 
you really, in a sense, as one goes along, you don't want to disappoint this other self, in a sense, which becomes the young composers or the public, like an extension of oneself, a, a peculiar extension. You acquiesce like a good parent to their ideas about you. I had a, an interesting thing uh, happen recently. I, I went to San Jose State College, California. Buckminster Fuller had been there for, I think, a month. Not so long before I arrived. And I gave a talk in which I uh, mentioned both him and Marshall McLuhan a good deal. And during the question period after the talk, a girl came up and said, Now, Mr. Fuller. <laughs> I was very pleased. It was very refreshing to be mistaken, you know, after you'd spent a whole evening with someone. But you didn't correct her. No, I was delighted. Yes. I, I laughed. Well, that's what I mean. <laughs> and I had then this this kind of freedom I was speaking of, hmm? a freedom from being uh, from being known, or at least I was I was being just unconsciously at the moment thought to be some person other than <laughs> Oh John, I, I remember I remember that marvelous <laughs> I just remember that wonderful story you told me about when you were in Holland on the radio station, remember? Mm -hmm. I mean where people get fixed ideas. No 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 no. When uh, this uh caretaker as you're going into the... Uh, the, the engineer. The engineer, He said, yes. what's the music like? That's right. And I said, it's like Mondrian. Yes. And then after he heard the music, I said, well, what do you think of it? And he said, well, it re it's like Mondrian. <laughs> you almost anticipated. But don't you consider that a fixed idea? I put something in his head and he, he could, it, it, it couldn't get it out. That was all there was in his head. Hmm? Yes. How about those that put up fixed ideas in our heads? Precisely. And what are, what are we going to do? I don't know. <laughs> it's intimidating. I remember um, I had constant conversations with Stockhausen and he would continually tell me to like big mm. orchestral works. Mm -hmm because he felt evidently that would be one area where I might fall on my face. See, so he insisted. So he would always <coughs> say, well, you must write a big piece next, mm -hmm. a big piece. But that was somewhat Boulez's reaction to my winter music when he looked at it. He was very impressed. And uh, he said, you must do something with this. <laughs> well, I'm easily intimidated, and it did bother me. I remember I did a film. I did a film score on a uh, on Willem, you know, de Kooning, and he heard about it, and he asked me how many instruments did I use, and I said five, and he looked very unhappy, <laughs> and I became unhappy. Finally, he pulled it once more. He about the big piece. And he asked me, what are you writing? I said, I want to write a piano piece for one finger. I okay. said, but it's so difficult, I don't know how. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't hear that um, concert that Christian Wolf and um, um, David Behrman, Kurt Schwarzig, and who was the fourth person uh, gave recently? You must have heard it. Yes, I was there. I, I wrote a piece for Christian. I know, and it, it, when you mentioned One Finger, and as I looked at that program of music, which I didn't hear, it struck me that that might have been that piece, was it? Almost. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened? With the piece. What happens in the piece, yeah. It's a piece for, for electric guitars. Yes, it? well, what happens in the piece is 
you know, it's a fantastic instrument in terms of pitches, is because the reality of the pitches that you write uh, doesn't manifest itself exactly like the pitches. So, right, right. I didn't get that. Well, I, the strings, yeah. you know, are constituted in such a different way than yeah. the other instruments that the whole, the pitch has another, um, goes into another domain whatsoever. You mean it's not, uh, you know, I still don't get it. You mean it is pitch, of course. Yes, it is pitch, but the pitches don't seem to be the same. Uh-huh. But, um... Is there a vibrato in that instrument? Oh, yes. There's so much that I wouldn't like it? You don't have to use it. Uh, you don't have to use yeah. it. Well, There's a gadget you, for it. You turn it up or down? Yeah. Uh, what did you do with the piece? Well, I wrote a piece for electric guitar, and I tried to overcome the fact that it was an electric guitar. And so Christian came over to the house, and I had him try various things, very strange things and strange registers. And, and when it didn't sound like an electric guitar, I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> I mean, it seemed too obvious just to write a piece for electric guitar, you know. I mean, that's... He plays it very uh, beautifully, very hesitant, very and, hesitant. And, uh, Mrs. Cunningham told me it was marvelously soft. Yes. And the, and yet it was coming through a, an electric sound system. Yes. It? And it was still very soft. Yes, it was very difficult to do. <laughs> I know it would be. It, it must have been magnificent. Mm. I have to recopy it. I, I gave him the only score. I wasn't sure about the piece. In fact, when they asked me for a piece of the program, mm. I said, well, there might be a possibility of a piece electric guitar and that's what they wrote down in the program the possibility of a piece <laughs> for electric guitar but it has another title now no the I think I have to get it back and look at it and oh I see mm -hmm. go over it and make a not a piece out of it but copy it out I think this I know you agree with this uh, that um one of the most useful things that could happen for the musical life now is a um, um, concept that would um, let people experience Christian Wolf's music. You know, John, at the same time, uh, for whatever reason, I mean, when I was in Europe, people speak to me about Christian Wolf, and I would tell them, well, you know, he, he's a professor of Greek at Harvard, and uh, I seem to be talking more about his background in the classics and his involvement in the classics than I did in the music, and for some reason, This is unfortunate for me, by the way. Christian is becoming a symbol for me the way maybe I feel that I really would have wanted to have been myself. I just can't understand. I'll never understand. In fact, you always talked about it. I remember reading something you once wrote about it, about writing the music and then what happens to it. I think you outlined in numerically various... Uh, steps of this particular the, no, did, did I did I understand you that that what he is is what you would have liked to to have been to have been yeah. uh, how, let's say then what he is mm. it's a very curious situation there's an enormous amount of patience in in the music which he has written that it, sh it, it is so patient that it is not being um, yet sufficiently heard and known. Yes, but maybe because of that, you know, 
I saw de Kooning on the weekend, and he, of course, is, uh, talks about the fact, he says, well, he says, I'm old hat. I'm old hat. And I pick up a piece that Christian wrote when he was 17, 1951. There's certainly nothing old hat about it. Mm. And the whole continuity of the work, I mean, it's just absolutely extraordinary mm. it's not musty you're not opening up a tomb and <laughs> you know no it'll be a magnificent concert mm. you know but at the same time i mean i would look at a piece of my own that i wrote 10 or 12 years ago and i feel it's old hat it's been around it's been digested by myself it's as if i've been it's like having a bone on a plate, and then you forgot that you were chewing on it. And you go back and you chew on it again, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think my pieces wouldn't have been that way if they weren't performed. If they weren't out in the world, so to speak. No, but this... And this makes a very interesting... Um, situation doesn't it bring up the question of history and wouldn't we uh, want the history so to speak to be straight whereas and it is straight in the case of music that's written in 52 so forth being known being digested and and being perhaps a little um uh, a little um, familiar. Hmm? Familiar, you know. I mean, last year, th th there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with this. In fact, I think the only thing that's wrong is that things that that uh, were done then, that that they are not yet familiar. Well, you know, it's awfully aggravating. I, I was with Lucas. Or that, far, with, wa or that just... ways have been found to to uh, just uh, not even consider them. Hmm? Yes. What were you going to say? I remember a year ago, I had a conversation with Lucas Foss, and he turns to me and he says, Oh, Morton, he says, you're the safest of us all. Well, it upset me. It upset me terribly. Why am I so safe now for him? What, what did he mean? He meant that what I'm doing now is absolutely safe. He doesn't see the risk in it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't see what's new about it. You're the safest of us all, he said. Well, that would be uh, a... Um... But what if they never got a hold of my intersections? Or what if they never got a hold of... of... all your work in the early 50s? I mean... That's what I mean. That history... Uh, History, in one hand, is not cruel when you see what it's done for Christian, you see, but it's very cruel when you see what it's done for me. <laughs> well, he certainly has, um, you mean then, um, still that freedom that we have lost. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And if I have my way, that's precisely what will happen. Hmm? That his um, work will become known, enjoyed, used, and um, and then... Um, digested. Digested, and uh, it, what, what will happen to it, I think, is um, just exactly what you sp speak of and what happened so soon for Webern, hmm? too. I remember, as you must, uh, early in the 40s, uh, being hardly able to contain myself for the excitement that a performance of Webern's music would give me. And now I can't think of anything more um, unnecessary to do. Yes, I know Lucas. Than to listen to any piece of his. I know Lucas on the weekend was telling me you must hear these new pieces. A premiere, he said, of these two pieces. They're wonderful pieces of Babe, and I just wasn't interested. Well, now we're getting to an interesting um, uh, 
series of thoughts, it seems to me, are we then consume art, hmm? And by consuming it, um, we destroy its usefulness. Do we, for instance, Sure, and then we have Marshall McLuhan. Do we, do, do we believe, uh, do, are we setting up then another belief than the one which we were taught when we went to school, which was that the more you know about something, the more you discover in it. Hmm? This was the defense of the masterpiece, wasn't yes. it? Now we have a situation... That's excellent. That's, that's quite good. Yeah. Now we have the feeling that uh, once we know something very well, we have, so to speak, had it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and by being in the world, you very soon had it with yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we change. I think we change at different uh, tempi. For instance, one could think, thinking of your work, as contrasted, say, with my work, that your work uh, does not change, whereas mine changes perhaps too much. Hmm? Uh, actually, in the in the, uh, over these years, knowing your work, uh, for me, it has changed enormously and goes on changing. The piece which you just showed me an hour or so ago is fantastic, this one for three pianos. And it's... Um, uh, I don't know... I don't know whether the sound of it would be as astonishing as looking at the manuscript was, but looking at the manuscript is... Um, is... Um, an extraordinary occasion for the uh, Im imagination. Hmm? It it um, it looks perfectly rational, at the same time that it's um, uh, utterly irrational. And the the result is that uh, I'm I I can think of no other word than poetry. Hmm? And yet it it doesn't um, mean anything when I say that. The actual case is is three pianos, two of which are, so to speak, coordinated and are working uh, in a way that is reasonable to them, whereas the third piano is uh, working according to some totally other uh, view. And these three are these two things, which are three, <laughs> um, which follow no known law, hmm? to create one, are going to work. <laughs> hmm? It's magnificent. I remember a time when your music was had a great deal of um, soft sounds in it, but um, at unexpected points came those loud sounds. Yes. And um, th that doesn't happen anymore in it, hmm? Or hasn't happened for some time. Not for a long time. And that's an absolutely um, earth-shaking change. <laughs> <laughs> And it, <laughs> I got to love the bomb. <laughs> no, no, but the fact that that change took place suggests that another might take place. You don't, do you? Really, um, think of yourself as on the search for for an image, no, which you will find and no. and linger with. I don't no. think so. No. 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 All I want, John, is to just have enough stamina to sit down and make an action. So if I'm going to search for anything, it's that stamina. <laughs> I found it this week in just simply <laughs> buying an air conditioner. <laughs> yeah. I'd say I couldn't work all last week and I attribute it to all psychological mm. conditions. I became very poetic about this state of not yes, working. Yeah, yeah. But I bought an air conditioner and I started to work right away. <laughs> Practical things. 
Exactly. I have though less and less time to uh, to do that. And I'm searching now to find some way to work as I travel around. But John, is it equally I... an old-fashioned idea to be alone and work? Well, I'm sure that any idea one might get could could be an idea that one could give up. I used, for instance, years and years and years ago, not be able to work until everything was in order, my desk in order. I don't know if you knew me then. And I, I had, in fact, to uh, copy over neatly the sketches of the previous day in order to even be able to continue to really? work. But that all that organization of my um, desk and of my manuscript and so forth was a kind of... Um, a way to fool myself into uh, working, hmm? which I then did. Then, since I moved to the country, I've gotten quite accustomed to a desk that is absolutely uh, chaotic. And if I had an idea, I suppose I could uh, could do it. But instead, the uh, what I mentioned before, the telephone ringing, the correspondence, and having to travel here, there, and the other place, there there's, seems to me to be no time because I still have the notion that that I should um, be um, in one place and waiting, so to speak, uh, for um, something to come to me, which I would then do. Hmm? But it's usually that one place. It, 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 home. It has always seemed to me to be home, <laughs> yes. Well, you know Stuckhouse is But now fake. I have to get the notion that it, I'm at home wherever I am. Yes, well, that's the whole thing, you see. <laughs> Stuckhausen told me that he's only happy <coughs> when he's writing in Germany. And I used to laugh at that, being that I'm anti-German. I used to laugh at that. But I found myself telling people in Europe, I mean... I can't wait till I get back to Lexington Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> to get to work again. To get yes. to work. And I found that I tried to work over there. We, we have examples of people who have been able <coughs> to uh, work while traveling and in various places. Mio is a great example of that. I, I have written a few pieces. Um, moving around, but they were generally pieces which I had begun at home. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask Stockhausen about that. He told me he wrote a very uh, famous piece of his in the, uh, in, the, in the plane, you see, looking out. I have to ask him if he didn't begin the piece in Cologne. But he also had a list in around where he showed me the pieces that Schoenberg wrote before he came to America and the pieces that he wrote when he settled in America to prove how dangerous it was to just change the locale. But there were beautiful pieces of Schoenberg uh, written in California, the trio, for instance. Well, he thought his great pieces were written but on the, the other side. Yeah, but the trio is a great piece. I, don't you think so? Yes. I think this whole business of a place and writing at your desk in your home is, just fortifies this whole need for identity, really. I think no matter who who you are, there is a certain loss of this identity. As we move around? As we move around. Or we assume many identities. <coughs> but don't you think that if our... if our work now that we have agreed we would like to write at home <laughs> has any... Um, is saying anything, as they say, you know... It is saying that we are at home wherever we are, for one thing. But it's saying that at home. And it's also it's also not uh, saying uh, uh, static things, but it's rather saying um, 
uh, moving, moving things, hmm? Don't you agree? I will... Yes, I do. Well, it's hard to say whether we're standing still or moving, hmm? Maybe what I'm really talking about is privacy. But who can speak of privacy now? You know, who's, who, who doesn't have an answering service and, and who answers his telephone? Just that. What privacy do you have? It's well, I know that when, remember when I was living... It's as though you were living in, um, in a hall somewhere. When I was living on 19th Street <laughs> in that building where, where Barney Newman lived upstairs, <laughs> I remember for about a year I took the phone out. And he came in one day and he said, oh, may I use your phone? I said, well, Barney, I, it's disconnected. He looked at me and then he looked down at the phone for a long time. And he said to me, you're a hero. How was it possible? How did you do it? <laughs> um, and I certainly did feel like a hero. <laughs> I think it's the most heroic thing we could do. To take the phone to out. To take the phone out. <laughs> and yet it's the most um, uh, asocial. Ah, come to it. Is that a virtue or... Uh... To be asocial? <laughs> mm -hmm. We come to it. That's it. No, but the, 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 thing the, is that, the thing is that anything that you want to do, <clears throat> you get a desire to do something. It's going to involve you willy-nilly in the use of the telephone. Now, at that point, when you're full of desire to accomplish something in society, uh, and the person at the other end has either an answering service or has pulled out the phone or something like this, it, it's, um, it presents an obstacle. It stops the fluency. And you, you must admit it's extremely annoying to you. You would like, at the point when your desires uh, move out to other people, to have them answer their telephones. Yes, but getting back to my earlier remark, getting out into the world means only one thing to me. Mm. Making a living. The people that are dear to me and who I love, I see, mm. and I will continue and I'll manage to see. But it can also mean, besides just making a living, it can mean... Um, um, Furthering your work, I, I mean to say the the conceptions and the, even the poetry of the work through telephone calls. Hmm? If not a telephone call, a letter or a cable. <laughs> <laughs> when well, you get a cable and a telegram, then you really know something's cooking. <laughs> No, I think in a sense that whole, that socialness, that emphasis no, I, on that I, 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 I'm a, I'm phenomena, a, yes. in a sense, it's just, um, just a rationalization. No, I, I'm, I'm actually thinking that if one were going to revise the Ten Commandments, you know, now, to suit the present social life, and even individual life, that one of them would be... Um, uh, thou shalt not have an answering service. You know? <laughs> and thou shalt not have a, an unlisted telephone number. In fact, thou shalt have a telephone and thou shalt answer it. <laughs> yes. But at the same time, though I'm talking against all this, I remember I, I, I couldn't have been more than 13 and I started to daydream about Varez and I thought I was doing something totally unrealistic. I'll never forget it. I picked up the phone book and I started to, you know, turn to the V's 
knowing that his name is not going to be there. And there it was, mm. Mm. you see. Mm. Yes, the same thing happened to me with Richard Bullock in Los Angeles. You never knew him. Oh, no, many people tell me, how do I reach John Cage? I say, just... Uh, just pick out the telephone. Pick out the telephone. <laughs> 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 what was the story about Richard Bullock? It was the same as your story about the rest. I only... I was in Los Angeles, and uh, I had been reading that he was the first to play the Schoenberg uh, Opus 11. And I wanted to meet him. And so I picked up the Los Angeles telephone book and there he was in it. I didn't meet him as a result of calling him. Uh, he refused to uh, see me until I actually stood in front of his house for 12 hours. Was Schoenberg in the telephone book in Los Angeles? He was later, but at that time, this was early in the um, yes. 30s, you know. Yes, but when he was there? When he was there, he was in the telephone book, sure. It's very curious uh, who's in and who isn't. <laughs> the telephone book? Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's a... Uh, it seems um, trivial, but I think it's at the heart of this problem of the... Um, of the individual in society. Yes, but I'm sure there's only one John Cage in the telephone book, but there are quite a few Morton Feldmans in the New York book. And Verez once called me, and he says that he just called another Morton Feldman. Mm -hmm. And he said to him, well, are you the uh, composer? <laughs> and the man said, no, he said, I'm in lingerie. <laughs> But what were you going to say about the telephone book? I don't know. I'm just simply exploring this um, situation of a person uh, living now, having work to do, which he learned to do at home. The home is, is uh, open, so to speak, at both ends now. And then as... Uh, We've been agreeing more and more um, one is obliged to go out, so to speak, to work, hmm? and one isn't even at home, and one isn't even there long enough to do one's work. So it seems to me that the that this fact of the home not being what it used to be, and is the spending of one's time being more and more not... Uh, at home that great changes must take place, not just as we have already made uh, changes in our work, but changes must be taken, must be made in, in the um, in the places, ways, times, etc., in which we do our work. Hmm. Yes. This can be expected to um, um, change our work. You remember uh, the story about a Varez piece that had a sound in it, and, and then uh, Rosenfeld, I think it was, went to visit Varez and discovered that the sound was in the environment and that Varese, without knowing it, had put it in his music. So, as, as uh, we move about and are less and less at home, uh, this uh, environment, which will, will never really be um, something familiar will more and more become um, tourists. Hmm? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Could have an effect upon the music. You were telling me as we came to the station here that you were planning to um, go back and forth a good deal. Hmm? <laughs> now this might just result in uh, back and forth pieces. <laughs>
don't you think? <laughs> Back and forth to England, hmm? Or to Europe? Do you have any desire to go to uh, Japan? Very much. I think they'd just uh, be delighted to have you there. That's what people always said to me, you know. And when I got to Japan, I discovered that they didn't like me any more there than they do here. You know? <laughs> Very curious, this question of death. The, you remember last winter, uh, Kiesler died, and, yes. and Varez died, and Henry yes. Cowell died. Yes. And now, uh, today in the paper, um, Suzuki died. I had such different uh, feelings with each of those uh, deaths. Today, with Suzuki's death, I, I felt as though nothing had changed. Um, absolutely, um, I suppose, um, I have a real feeling that he's of no difference between life and death at that point. In all the other cases, I felt um, either loss or release or um, something like that. Loss of a member of the family or loss of um, someone irreplaceable. Maybe it was because Suzuki wasn't really um, uh, well. He was a magnificent person. I was going to say that he was um, an introducer. He was the sort of person I've always wished uh, critics were. He made things um, uh, something you could deal with. And he could do it without even opening his mouth, just by being in the room. Did I ever tell you that marvelous story about um, him with the uh, philosophers at the Congress in Hawaii, the one where they for three days discussed reality, and Suzuki never opened his mouth? <laughs> And finally, at the end of the third day, since he'd been invited all the way from Japan, they thought he ought to say something. Uh, the chairman said, um, oh, Dr. Suzuki, um, uh, would you say something about reality? And he still didn't say anything. So the chairman uh, said, well, this table, for instance, that we're sitting at, uh, would you say that it was real? And Suzuki looked up and said, yes. And then the chairman said, in what sense would you say it was real? And Suzuki said, in all senses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely certain, though, that, that Duchamp's work is of great importance in relation to those things I was saying earlier about the telephone, about uh, changes in our, our way of living in the world and as a result, changes in, in the way, in the circumstances under which we do our work, and finally, what it is that we do. I was just reading today, uh, I think it was an Alice James's diary. Who is Alice James? Uh, she was the sister of the James brothers. Really? Yes, she was quite extraordinary. And I think this is 1885, there was an, an, an entry about that they were talking about putting a um, telephone to Paris, to France, a connection. And there was resistance against it for some reason. And one of her friends said they must be afraid that the French might say something clever into it. <laughs> and... and uh, <laughs> yes, well, in a sense, maybe what the telephone does when it rings, it rings. <coughs> it takes us away from ourself, and I think our self, or the whole concept of self, is not, doesn't work. 
I mean, for whom the telephone rings? It rings for me, obviously, unless it's a wrong number. And um, it takes me out of this, this other dream about being an artist in some other time or some other place. Not really some other time. It's really some other place other really than the reality that I'm living now. But at the same time, when I wake, I don't have that feeling that my sounds or that the music itself in a sense, is someplace else. It is what it is, and it's there. Maybe, in a sense, I'm more concerned the fact like when the baby is sleeping and the phone rings. I don't want to waken it up, you see. <laughs> I don't think it's my concern so much, but I think it's it, it, uh, for myself, that is, but for, my, but for the work that I'm doing. Um, which in a sense, is becoming much more separate from me than when I used to be. When I used, to, I used to feel when I was younger that I was inseparable from what I was doing. And now there is a split. There is the work and there is myself. And if I have any problem, it's to keep the work from becoming an object or a dead thing. Oh, well, that it isn't. Um, and it, it has life the more you leave it alone, don't you think? To live its own life. That's become my attitude. What you'd said about the baby, you know, and the work, uh, and having its life, and the possibility of this interruption, uh, waking it up or altering it. Uh, just that that could um, be seen not as an interruption or a threat or a danger or anything, but as um, something like, um, say, inspiration a little fresh air coming in. <laughs> With the ringing. <laughs> With the ringing, yes. Well, I think that's the point, in a sense. I think it becomes clearer. I must admit that as we're talking, I didn't know exactly what... We would talk about. What we were talking... Not only what we will talk about, but what we're talking about now. Mm. But I think it's really becoming clearer for me that it's just impossible any longer to escape from these interruptions. Right. In fact, it almost becomes as if we ourself then is the interruption. Right. And we're very good at that. And we're very good at that. <laughs> better than the telephone. <laughs> better, better, much better. Because we can, we can do that without ringing. <laughs> yes, of course, it makes us seem so ridiculously pompous. For example, one is working, one thinks one is God knows where. One thinks one is thinking the most sublime thoughts. The phone rings. We forget it. How good could it have been? <laughs> anyway, you know, these whole notions of our ideas of what we would use, what yeah, we would call yeah. concentration. Right. You know, there's a marvelous story about somebody visiting Haydn. Ask him if he ever wrote any uh, programmatic music or he ever used it as a, an idea, an impetus to make a piece of music. And Haydn said, yes, there is this uh, movement in the symphony which is a dialogue between God and a sinner. But I don't remember which symphony that was. <laughs> John, it's marvelous seeing you again. Yes, it's nice to see you, Marty. It seems as if the only time we get a chance to talk with each other is on the radio. <laughs> well, it's a nice situation because no one else seems to be around. 
But I think everybody should get equal time to talk with each other on the radio. There's so little talk these days. and You know, especially with young people, they're very suspicious of it. What, what do you mean? Well, they seem to be fed up with the rhetoric. Or what I, they thought oh, was I see, rhetoric, yes. you see. I heard, too, that... Um, People no longer bother saying uh, hello or goodbye. That they just... Um, and perhaps if they don't say hello and goodbye, they don't need to talk in between. <laughs> We've both been in England since we talked before. Um, I did a lot of talking well, in England. I know, and you're very much loved there. Uh, I saw that newspaper they have called... Um, uh, International L London's, Times. London's answer to the Village Voice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and the, but there was an article uh, about you and by you and so forth in it. And everywhere I went, it they asked they they like talking there, and everyone wants you to say anything that you have to say. I even went to a a meeting of the ICA. What does that mean? The uh, yes. I what, talked there also. What, what, what does it mean? I didn't talk there. Institute of Institute Contemporary of Art, yes. But the, they had a, the, a lecture by a painter. Who was the painter, John? He was... Um, gosh, I can't remember his name. Yes. He, he was actually an American painter living in England. Kitai? That's right, with yes. a Calvinist attitude. Yes. Yes. But that meeting, although it was not at all the same, reminded me of the of the meetings at the Eighth Street Artist Club years ago. The great difference was that the the public was uh, was open and gentle with the speaker. And I, I didn't have that. And I don't um, recall that that gentleness on the part of the New Yorkers in the late 40s? Oh, I found them extremely gentle, but I gave a talk at this particular organization, and Sylvester... David Sylvester, yes. ...was in the audience, and he was more or less heckling me, and he was very argumentative. And I found that in New York, I, I gave a lecture in New York, and there was Sylvester in the audience heckling me. Yes, I And you know, my eyes are terrible, and... I was waiting for the question period, and then I hear this hostile, edgy question, and I recognize the voice, and sure enough, it was Sylvester. But the talk, it's very interesting. For example, what the young people today say in America, they want truth. They don't want to talk to it. They want to get it through osmosis, but they're looking for truth. While all the young English kids that I met want alternatives. Yes, ideas. Hmm? Even more than ideas, just alternatives. Because so you mean something to do or, or just a way a, to be? Or what? Well, for example, that marvelous remark of Kafka is, he said, I don't want freedom, just show me a way out. Yeah. The American kids want freedom, and they want truth. And I found the English kids, again, wanted alternatives, which, after all, it's because of a lack of alternatives that people, you know, commit suicide. I mean, if they have alternatives, it's less likely for them to blow their brains out. They gave me the impression that I mentioned before of, of gentleness. I don't know. I don't know that I meant gentleness on their part so much as what it was that they were made me feel gentle yes. toward them. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. Very beautifully put. That's very true. Don't you think? Yes. Uh, I felt as though they were in some kind of springtime, as though they had been, uh, they hadn't even been above ground very long. Uh, I had the feeling it was essential to be careful with them. Why careful? Because you felt either... Well, after... They were too fragile? After a winter when, when um, nothing, so to speak, growing, and I think the English winter was the, uh, the 
the period of its empire. And with the loss of empire, this, uh, this life begins to grow, not in the older people, who are perfectly well established in their ways, but in the young people. And that life is such a new experience for them that they're, rather than barking at a new idea, which was formerly the English custom, they listen and uh, take, um, take in a very youthful way seriously what they hear. So that one, one feels the necessity to say something which would be um, um, useful to youth. Isn't that different than than um, than a, than a feeling, say, that we have here, even among young people in the United States? You have the feeling here that there's a certain strength that that they would rather quickly understand whether or not they could use an idea, and either either take it or not. Yes, and also I found over there that. They were extremely flattered that ideas were addressed to them. Right. And, you know, that whole sense of authority there is still pretty uh, oppressive. It's still very strong. I, yes, and the economic situation is miserable. I gave a lecture in a beautiful art school at Bath. Were you there? It was... Oh, you, with Mark Lancaster, probably. That down, it's absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful. And Sir Michael Tippett came to my... He did? Yes. He came to my lecture. And, uh, oh, this will amuse you. At the end of the lecture, I played one of these conversations that we've been having on WBAI to them. And uh, in the middle of that, he walked out. Mm. But I was talking to people later, and I said, my, if I was knighted, yes. I wouldn't even feel the necessity to write music. The way the establishment takes themselves so seriously. I mean, no detachment, no ironic detachment. So pompous. They should have read... You mean Tippett was pompous? No, I didn't meet Tippett, but I met other Tippets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But one very charming man there in England, um, and not at all pompous, is um, Sir Arthur Bliss, a composer who, might, who has some title uh, connected with um, the king, ke keeper of the king's music or something like that. I, I did meet him. And I had, I had met him, um, oh, I think it was in 1962 in, in Venice, when Merce Cunningham and... Carolyn Brown and David and I gave a program in La Fenice, and which was reported later falsely in Time magazine, the article that said that um, Stravinsky marched out of the of the hall shaking a cane and and talking loudly, which was not the case at all. <coughs> anyway, Sir Arthur Bliss came backstage afterward, and and said how lively he found the the uh, program. And um, that there were simply a few malcontents in the audience. Mm -hmm. Then, in connection with the manuscript collection that I've been making of 20th century manuscripts for the last two years, uh, it was for that reason that recently I called him in London, and he immediately sent me a beautiful um, score of his. So I didn't feel he was pompous. Mm -hmm. And yet, of all the British composers, he, he has at least the title uh, by means of which he could be the most pompous. <laughs> oh, I suppose I'm being unduly critical. I think that the same thing would apply to people in influential positions, I suppose, any place. What I was most glad to hear uh, in London, I had been there before in 64, so there had been a lapse of two years. And when I was there in 64, 
Cornelius Cardew and his music was uh, virtually unknown. Now he's very active, both as a performer, as a composer, and uh, also as a, a journalist, I think on The Observer. Now he's not in England, he's at Buffalo in the um, Creative Associates is attached to the State University there. But I was very glad to, to hear that England is taking his work, using it. Have you seen him? Yes, we... A piece of his, you know, was played last week in New York, and I was at the rehearsal, and I was at the concert, and then the following afternoon he was going back to spend Christmas with his family. In England? In England. Mm -hmm. And we had lunch together. What piece was it? Oh, it's a piece that is to go on for a few hours, actually. <laughs> and he keeps on adding segments to it. What we heard in New York was the American segment. <laughs> a work in progress. Yes. This is. Do you find that notion... You've never done that, really, have you? No. You consider your whole work... <laughs> <laughs> I always would felt you say that, that you're, uh, would that you say that everything that you've written is a work in progress? You know, John, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> now, it might may take me a little time to answer it, and it might seem a little roundabout. But it's in. Uh, it, but let me yeah. Let me talk about it for a little while. The other day. I read something that Freud wrote. You know, he kept on revising his interpretation of dreams through the years, but I th he reached a point where he said that he cannot add to it, even in the light of uh, more advanced research, either on his part or others, because it will take away its historical value. And... You mean historical, the, the value of an accomplished fact. Mm. What he did, Yes, see, yes, yes. Even though what he might have presented at the time wasn't so, as sophisticated or as complete as in as later in, years. Uh -huh. And... I thought that was very interesting bit of information. In other words, was his position more in terms of his historical breakthrough or in conveying further insights? Further insights. Well, but, and I began to think of my work over the past 15 years. And, which is not unrelated to this whole idea of work and progress. And I began to see how week by week it was changing. Yes. And the whole idea of a work in progress seems to me to be some kind of fixed idea that doesn't change. One just carries out this particular process. Well, it could be, yes. But then if you think of something which is not a work in progress, that is, say, all the various compositions you've made as a work in progress, then, of course, it's something changing and lively. But if you have a plan as... Um, a composer might have of something that would take a life to do or perhaps more than a life to do and then he simply did as much of it as he could. People have done such things. Then it takes on, as you say, this deadly aspect. I think then one really has to know, for example, what work is and what progress is. Mm. And I'm a little confused about the both.
Well, one could say that work is um, whatever it is that one does. Tell me, John, do you believe in progress? I'm beginning to. <laughs> I, I mean, would you go along with something, for example, like Karl Heinz uh, Stockhausen's remark that if the work, in a sense, doesn't have its genetic roots in Weben, it's not worth very much today. Uh, it's very curious because as I was coming here to the station to meet you, I wasn't thinking about Webern at all. I was thinking about Mozart. And I was finding very attractive um, views I had of Mozart, oh, nearly 20 years ago. I don't remember whether I ever mentioned them to you. But it struck me once when I lived on 17th Street, and when I used to play the piano a good deal, that what made Mozart's music so interesting and so exceptionally interesting and so different actually from from other music even of the same period was that there was a greater complexity in it of um, specifically of different kinds of scales of um, on the one hand in a given short um, piece, fragment of a given piece, one could find, for instance, a, a chromatic scale, a diatonic scale, and a scale formed of thirds and fourths um, uh, related to the, um, uh, brought about through, through the harmonies. Hmm? not through the harmonies presented all at once, but presented um, one note following the other. That's such a simple notion that one would think offhand that every composer did that. But if you look, for instance, at Bach, you don't find uh, that presence all at once of three scales, whereas you do find it almost everywhere in Mozart. The reason I was thinking about it was that I have been asked to, oh, for several years I've been asked to write some harpsichord music by a lady in Switzerland yes. who's probably asked you, maybe you've already written it for her. I tried. I, Antoinette Vischer. I don't... And I've decided um, this year to to fulfill that commission. And I was wondering how, how I could write for harpsichord in a way that would be interesting to me. And if, say, I, I um, thought, well, I'll have to begin with Webern, I doubt whether it, it would be interesting. Furthermore, I've already done that. Not that frivolously I must do something new every time, but in relation to that instrument, the harpsichord, what would one do nowadays? And I'm not thinking either of making it electronic, although that would make it interesting, certainly. I may make it alternatively electronic, but I would like it to be interesting apart from the electronics, too. And I think it will come about through an enrichment of the notion of scales. Isn't that an odd idea to have? Not in relation to a harpsichord. <laughs> Not in relation to a harpsichord. No, it needs it because those sounds are so sharp. Hmm? They have no duration. 
And so uh, one of them, one, uh, one note, calls really not for the silence surrounding it that would have come from Webern, could have come from Webern, but that one note asks for another. Hmm? Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Necklaces of notes. <laughs> Or even uh, rows of notes and scales of notes and modes of notes and so forth. I would like to make a great multiplicity of such things. It might be interesting, and it certainly wouldn't be. Um, they, they, what would you say, Webernian? Hmm? Would it? I don't think it would. Now, I could see for this specific example of the harpsichord, but in general, Karlheinz's remark. Could you talk about that a little more? Well, I... Our, our friendship, for instance, begins with Webern, doesn't it? Yes. The circumstance of our meeting begins with the, our both having walked out for, uh, of a Philharmonic concert, a Webern piece had just been played, and we shared the desire not to hear anything else afterward because we'd been so deeply moved. And I was... Um, It's true, though, that if we had not met then and were to meet now for the first time, it would have to be some other music than Webern's that would bring us together hmm? in the same way. I mean, we would be able now to listen to Webern and then to Tchaikovsky or anything, and it wouldn't enter our minds <laughs> <laughs> to leave the hall simply because someone had played Webern, hmm? would it? Not at all. It would have to be something else. What, we don't know. Hmm? But I think you agree with him. With Stockhausen? Yeah. I'm trying to disagree. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to say that there are other other possibilities than Webern for the birth of new music. Well, don't you think that, for example, like, Verez was to us here in New York, perhaps what Webern was to them in Europe? He could be. He could have been. But I don't think he was. Uh, for the reason that that we didn't know how he did what he was doing. But the, uh, strictly speaking, classical aspects of Webern's music, that is the, the um, canons, the uh, retrograde canons, the, the balance, uh, the this, the that, the other thing, all of which are perfectly analyzable, even though they're complex, one can analyze them. That enables people to see that something could be done with those ideas. But I think, in the case of Varez, that it was not clear what he was doing. And that even though one loved it, responded to it, and so forth, it had... Um, it, 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 it was not clear what one could do with it. Hmm? One certainly couldn't do what he had done with it, since he had already done it. Hmm? Yes, but those that got involved with Weber did what Weber did with it. No, but there's a great difference between, um, say, Boulez's second piano sonata or, or um, Karl Heinz's um, uh, piano pieces and, and the music of Weber. I mean, a great d difference. There's the only one who, who is somewhat slavish with regard to Weber is... Um, 
is Luigi Nono. Hmm? Mm-hmm. And of course, there are many people who, who perhaps um, also are slavish to Webern, but we don't know what their names are. Hmm? Nor will we. Yes, but you know, this brings up a very interesting juxtaposition for today. The other evening, um, oh, I don't think I'll mention the painter that uh, I had this conversation with because uh, he was talking about a colleague of his and he said that this particular colleague failed because he painted like an art lover. <coughs> now, <coughs> yes. wouldn't you th say that by the fact that it was difficult technically to comprehend what exactly Verez loved in terms of process makes his work for this present climate. If we agree with this painter that said that if one works as an art lover, you can't possibly succeed because you already a priori had standards of success in mind. So if we can go along with this idea, Verez is the one who is more pertinent, oh, more important. I mean, for that fact alone, Uh, Varese is obviously um, uh, magnificent, and many things he he did, we are obliged to do. Hmm? I mean, he changed uh, music so that it, it was different after him. And in but, and you agree, don't you? In a mysterious way. Yes. I, I think that um, the changes we now observe in music came from many different points, not just Webern. Varese, now certainly one could say Ives, hmm? I mean, for the Americans, how about that airiness? I know this is a, just a generalization, but that airiness that you would find on, uh, say, in Virgil Thompson's music or in Copeland's music. Or in Satie's music. Hmm? Yes. I don't know if Vaben changed how I heard. I think that um, Verez made me aware of how I hear. I guess the problem here is that the the great interest in um, in Webern comes from the fact that one can approach his work, um, as I said, through analysis and therefore intellectually, rather than through one's feelings, so that he could immediately change the way people were thinking. Hmm? And he did. Uh, if you were going to have your thinking changed... Vaben was the one to do it. Vaben was the one to do it. You know, it's a pity that we can't look on music, say, for example, the way Kierkegaard uh, say, would discuss another philosopher, like Hegel, for example. He wrote someplace that if Hegel, say in some preface, just wrote that what he was conveying 
was a speculative, experimental. If he just wrote it someplace once, then he would have been the greatest mind that ever lived. But the fact that he didn't, to kick a card, made him seem comic. Now, in the way, for example, that Stockhausen's music, to me, I mean, is sweeping and as impressive as it is, there is the element of the comic. Did you read Reston in the Times this morning? And what did he say? He said that it was a bad year for big shots. Bad year? For big shots. <laughs> <laughs> and what is this, one of those summary articles of the whole year? Of the whole year, just that the whole idea of a powerful nature, the whole idea that money can't buy everything anymore, mm -hmm. the whole idea of this not taking authority as seriously as one did in the past, and that whole machinery that goes with it. I thought of sending that article to Karl Heinz. <laughs> It'll have to go 3,000 miles. Hmm? He's here. He's in, well, it is. He's in California. California, yeah. yes. Especially after he told me that he was one of the, was he the only one or one of the few that wouldn't donate a manuscript? I'm still hoping to get him. <laughs> <coughs> I think that that quality of um, classicism that was in uh, Webern and which made his um, music useful for people who wanted to uh, change their thinking about music exists now in the work of Christian Wolff. That I found years ago that, that if one were teaching music and wanted to provide a discipline for a student, that first one had to give up teaching harmony, next one had to give up teaching counterpoint. Now I think one would have to give up teaching Webern, and I think you'd be at the present moment a fairly good teacher if you would teach Christian Wolff. Not teach him, but teach his music to a student. Of course, the difference is, is that there are many things I would enter into Christian's music that are absolutely mysterious, and you don't know why he would do it. I don't find it that logical. Do you? I have the feeling, though, that if I um, studied his work, as though it had been a work in progress, mm -hmm. not one which he had planned to do in mm -hmm. progress, but something, as I studied the work years ago of Virgil Thompson and followed his footsteps, so to speak, that I would see, a, um, I would be able to follow a mind at work the steps taken by which made sense. Hmm? I mean sense that could change my mind and my thinking. Hmm? I mean in this classical sense as opposed to the whole world of, of, um, of things done for some other reason than thinking, such as feeling mm -hmm. uh, dramatic um, uh, reasons, etc. Hmm? Even personal reasons. Oh, I agree with you, John. I've said it myself. I mean, I'm convinced that Christian is and will have the place of Aben in terms of 
in terms of the mind? I think so. And I so long for that concert, which we haven't had yet, of his work. I feel much better about it since our last talk when I was against it, remember? <laughs> mm -hmm. What are you writing now? I just drew the double bar line this morning on um, a work for, uh, oh, it's a large chamber work. It's very much like my three piano piece, where there are three different things going on mm. at the same time. They're not really three pieces superimposed, they're just three things going on mm. to make one. And it took so long, months and months and months of work, just to write six pages. Beautiful. Yeah. What, what is your attitude now toward um, uh, space, toward, uh, say you have three things like this going on at once, does it enter your mind to, to have them happen in different points in the space, or do you want them to happen together? No, they're at different points in the space. Different points in the yes. space. Yes. Um, I utilize various controls, mostly the silences are measured. That's only that it will happen in different spaces rather than close together. But what I'm pursuing is the whole vertical journey. You know, we know everything about the horizontal. Yes. Everything. Yes. We really know everything. Except I just might find something about those scales. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You might find something. Then Probably that's, then, not. Then it's under the category of meaningful relationships. <laughs> but we do know practically, I wouldn't say everything, we know practically, we're getting there. But the vertical is such a strange experience because it's like, well, did you ever play this game um, when you were a kid where you fill the water right up to the top on the glass and you keep on adding pennies? And it doesn't spill over. And it doesn't spill over when you have half of the glass full of pennies. Yes. And that's how I find the vertical. That no matter how many sounds I throw into it, there is a hunger. For more, you mean? <laughs> for more. Or a capacity for more. Now I threw three pieces, actually, into this simultaneity. And it could have much more. It's so full of space, so full of air. It's still breathing. Yes, yes. It's endless. Yes, yes. And it absolutely well, when did keeps that, its transparency. That's one of the glorious things about new music now, is the fact that you, it can be extremely thick and be full of this space and air. This How, transparency. When did that happen, for heaven's sake? It certainly is one of the uh, characteristics of, the, of um, present music, that things can be very thick, but there's always this sense of airiness. It's amazing. I, no, I think that phenomenon... I remember, for instance, when, we made, when David Tudor and I made the recording of my cartridge music, we had always thought that a single performance was fairly thick. Hmm? But we did see that it had space in it. Then when we made the recording, we made four performances and superimposed them. And when we listened to the result, we discovered that it, uh, it was no um, thicker than, it, than one had been and that there was just as much space and airiness as ever. And you could add some more. That's a very, very different experience from um, from Schoenberg's um, 
attitude toward Bach when he was making those um, ar arrangements for orchestra, you know, of pieces of Bach. His view was that if it was possible to add another um, counterpoint, that one should. Hmm? But he felt that he would add as many as were possible, and since he only added a certain number, he felt that more were not possible. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> but I think this experience you talk about, and when it happened, I don't think it happened with Weber. That is, I don't think it was our mind mm. that prepared us for this. Again, I must go back to Verez. I think that there is that, you know, that marvelous stationary, almost grandeur mm. of Verez. I think it has to do with the fact that we we began to hear closer in time and especially we began to hear without the necessity of relationships. When I think of Verez, though, I tend to think of um, um, either of of messages being sent, say by um, s some new technological means, or I think of of a um, I guess I'll use your term. Uh, I think of a vertical structure. Hmm. This is what you're talking about. Yes. It is a vertical structure. It, it then takes on the aspect of um, um, the rejection of time, doesn't it? Hmm? Yes, well, you know, uh, one of the difficulties, I mean, that Verez does present to us is um, the, say, the reality of the material that we hear these messages. Well, you know that the material, what, what, whatever sounds you hear, you know you really meant them. Hmm? They're not substitutes for some other sound. Most composers of his time uh, wrote first for piano and then just colored it, but he didn't do that. He, he was using these sounds that he was using. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really what I meant. In other words, that, I feel, is a reality. While the material... Yes. No, it's absolutely true of Varenne. The, the material is something else. There is this dichotomy between the material and yet this yeah. other reality that we hear. Mm. You mean in Varez? In Varez. You mean you hear the material and it, and it's something other than itself, or what? What do you mean? I hear the that direct impact of the sound of the sound not becoming a symbol. That's true. I agree, and that's magnificent. And it was he certainly who did it. Hmm? And this element of continuity to me is uh, is not just counting time. Right, right. No, it's um, that's almost irrelevant. That's the word, I think. Yeah. What do you think, though, about uh, something that worries me about Verez. Wh when he uh, died, there were those concerts um, suddenly springing up, given simply because he died. 
Uh, and the performances, it struck me, were not good. What is necessary to make a good performance of a piece by Barres? It strikes me that it's not an easy thing to accomplish. Well, it's essentially a sonic experience. And the conductors and the musicians, you know, I mean, they don't know what that word means. They're playing notes, obviously. And it doesn't come out right. They think they're playing a very energized. And that's not it. So, and that's not it at all. It's virtually the opposite of that. I think so. I don't think of it as in terms of energy. He had a beautiful sense of knowing just how long it takes for that, town, that sound to speak. Beautiful. This would explain the repeated notes then and those um, uh, things that appear to be... Uh, moving. Moving that aren't. Yes. Mm. Because if the note changed, this movement would enter, hmm? <laughs> which it mustn't. Hmm? Get a hold of ionization, and you'll notice the beautiful, again, vertical layers of how he perceived the the nature of that particular instrument, that particular sound. And you don't hear it, that performance. You don't hear it on the recordings. And consequently, when you take away all those, uh, that wonderful world of gradation, yes. what you hear is just this onslaught. I think you would probably get a good performance among young musicians in the universities now, don't you? It would certainly be more probable than among um, grown-up musicians, hmm? Yes. And a young conductor. <laughs> <laughs> Someone like Jim Tenney. Oh, Could right. do it, yes. yes. Oh, that, there was among those uh, Varese Memorial Concerts a superb one at the Judson Church on Washington Square. I heard of it, I couldn't go. And um, it wasn't Tenney, who was it? It was, um, it was um, Malcolm Goldstein who did it and who performed um, one of the pieces from the Middle Ages that Varese loved so much. Mm -hmm. Forget just which one. And, and a piece of Varese, and then um, a piece of, um, of Goldstein's himself. It was a superb concert. Everybody's hair was standing on end. And um, there were only about 40 or 50 people there. It was one of those rare occasions. Um, I forget whether we applauded or not, but as I remember, there was no applause. <laughs> Just experience. You know, to this day, Varese's position, whatever... Uh, many people would have different feelings about him, of course, but especially amongst academic world, the fact that you can't teach for as oh, this is the thing I mentioned earlier yes, makes for a very um, you peculiar remember uh, situation and how they how they're going to evaluate him because. Well, there was a young composer um, years ago who, who was a pupil of Varese. Forget his name 
began with W. Wilkinson. Wilkinson. English boy. Who uh, wrote some articles of an analytical character that simply didn't convince me. What you say is convincing about the rest. Well, I guess we need the ones that, that, um, change. Our hearing as well as our minds. Right. I was thinking of something else. I don't want my else. mind changed. I was going to go, <laughs> I was going to go farther than um, hearing. I was going to say change us. At least for res, I mean, not because of the picturesque uh, titles or this city life vision of his music. I mean, that is silly. I mean, I could actually say that he changed my mind and the real sense of... Uh, of the word. Of the word. He changed my <laughs> mind without putting any thoughts into it. <laughs> I mean, I think it's self-evident, especially in this post-war, World War II age with Stockhausen and Boulez growing up, as well as others, that we have minds. I think it's a feeble defense now to have a mind. I think it was <coughs> kind of like a reaction against uh, the bourgeoisie, that people felt that the only way they could really have a defense against it, and that mode of life and values, uh, to begin to have minds en masse. Mm -hmm. You know that story? Beethoven's brother wrote him a letter, and in the bottom he signed it, landowner. And Beethoven wrote back, and under Ludwig von Beethoven, he wrote brain owner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. I can't see the use of a mind when you want to change it all the time. And that's one of my arguments, for example, say of so many brilliant, colleagues of mine is that they change their sound to fit their mind. What, what do you mean um, by that? In other words, the sound is not the important thing, actually. Mm, mm. It's the mental process that produces a certain result. Mm, mm, mm. And so they continually change it, you know, like dirty underwear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I always consider that very irresponsible. My my tendency actually is to like to um, find different ways to use the mind. Hmm? discovery, etc., invention, um, what one calls new ideas, etc. All, all such things, as you know, appeal to me. However, I like very much what you say when you say uh, you see no sense in having a mind if it is going to change. More 
and more, in fact, these things that that would appear to be opposites strike me as as being um, not only compatible but, uh, so to speak, identical. Hmm? At any rate. I can imagine that mind of yours, which doesn't wish to change, having a new idea. Hmm? <laughs> well, of course, I shouldn't talk about this on the radio, John. <laughs> but the other day, I was having a conversation with a dear friend, and I said, you know, here I'm always talking against the mind. I'm talking against ideas, and I look around at all the music being written today, and golly, I said, you know, I'm the only one who has any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of the, of the piece, the, the three uh, things going on at once? It, it, <coughs> it's for, for instruments? Yes. How many, the, how many instruments? Are? Oh, I mean, four pianos. And four pianos? Yes. Well, one piece had two pianos, and then each of the other pieces had one piano each, you see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really wanted to do something impractical. Mm -hmm. How many, how many uh, instruments then altogether? Oh, there were a few tubas and a few Good cellos. And about 16. You know, I really wanted to do something What's it called? practical. Just, no, it hasn't, I, I don't have mm -hmm. a title yet. I want to do something. I wanted to write something that... Uh... So I said to Cynthia, I said, well, I don't have to worry about this being played. I could keep it around the house for a long time. <laughs> and then Cornelius Cardew came over the house and he took a look at it. And he said, this will make a marvelous piece for a concert I want to do in London. <laughs> <laughs> There's no escape. <laughs> right. I had a letter just now. I had, I had written to Carl Heinz, um, asking him, uh, oh, for about the fifth time, to send me a manuscript for this collection. He had replied to none of the letters, and finally, he, um, I have a new form of stationery which invites replies. Have I sent you one yet? No, please do. <laughs> it's called a not notogram, and I write a, a very sharp message on one side, and on the other side. The uh, person I'm writing to can write his answer and, and return it at the same time that he can keep his copy of the full correspondence because two copies are sent to him with a carbon enclosed. Does, does the stationery have a carbon? Yes. Where did you find this? Well, you get it from Texas. And uh, <laughs> I also have um, envelopes with windows in them so that when people get these letters, they think they're bills. <laughs> <laughs> And they they open them immediately, and then uh, all they can do is reply because there's very little space, uh, and it's the simplest thing in the world to reply. And it's a pity they don't. Is I there don't, a return postage on? There should be a return window envelope in it, and some arrangement, but there isn't. How about return postage? No. <laughs> At any rate, he replied to this particular letter, and I think because of the form, and he said that he he thought that. I had realized, because of his silence, that he didn't intend to um, contribute a manuscript to my collection. And then he went on to complain that um, very little new music is played in the United States. It's always struck me that we have quite enough played. But then I was reminded of his complaint when um, when you mentioned that your piece may very well be heard first in London before it's heard here in the United States. Things may be corrected, though, if changes in geography amount to correction. Uh, There are now, in each state of the Union, um, art councils. 
and they're going to be phenomenally active. Uh, just this fall, Merce Cunningham and the Dance Company and, and um, we're in Chicago performing for uh, Negro children, part of an anti-poverty program and also part of the Illinois Arts Council's program. And they informed me that they were planning for next year some 5,000 performances. What those performances are going to be doesn't enter their mind. But they will make arrangements for giving, they, uh, place arrangements and money arrangements for 5,000 performances. And then at the last minute, probably, they will have to fill the blanks of what it is that they're presenting. But this is going to ha happen not only in Illinois, but in every other state, which is going to amount to an enormous um, increase in um, activity for the performing artists. It may give the United States the lively aspect that the WPA gave it back in the 30s and early 40s. You remember the statement of Maggie Dunham? When she came back from Europe, she said, uh, we're all looking forward to the return of the WPA. It's the only thing we ever had any talent for. <laughs> <laughs> and then if they um, increase the number of broadcasting stations, radio and television and so forth, as a result of uh, laser techniques. The United States may just become as interested in, in um, doing things in the field of the arts as, say, other countries are. That is, say, it might become the um, fact that turning on such and such a um, a radio, or one would automatically hear the music of Ives, and turning on another, one would automatically hear the music of Barres. Perhaps there will be other changes in, in how we enjoy the arts, so that we won't even need radio stations. We'll have continual concerts going on that we can simply tune into. Mm. And then the number of possibilities would be um, countless. If there's anybody around left to write this music. Well, we have to assume that. Mm. I'm or if we don't have any you mean anyone to listen is what you mean don't you no I meant anyone <laughs> to write <laughs> but you don't need Ives to write Ives or Varez to write Varez hmm? no I only said that with a heavy heart because a student of mine was uh, reclassified for the army. Well, this brings up another question, and in my mind it brings up the question of the work of, of Buckminster Fuller and the, his um, concern to increase the usefulness of the world's resources so that the things that one wants to have will be had by all the people who are living. If that kind of problem were solved, then there would be no reason for the wars and deprivations that we now have. We have, however, in this century, just as we have made great changes in the field of music, so we've made great changes in the field of, of the distribution of these and the usefulness of these world's resources at the beginning of this century, I forget what the figures are, but it was something like 
seven or at most 14% of the world having and the rest of the world not having, whereas now we're at, at something like 47% having and 53 not having. And according to Fuller, by 1972, we'll be at 50-50. <laughs> and by the year 2000, we will have solved this problem, and it will be then only good reason, I mean, it'll make good sense then to object to war when we will have solved the problems that lead up to it. Last week, uh, after we uh, had talked, I mentioned to you that an idea that was in a Kaufman uh, article, let me read it to you. It comes toward the end of, um, of an article that's in the Architectural Forum for September of last year. And it was um, taken from a talk that he gave at Aspen, where I also uh, spoke. I was extremely impressed by his talk, and I think you'll be interested in these ideas. It's about design, but nowadays it seems to me that anything is about anything else and that this is, uh, can be interpreted as being about sociology or about being about music or whatever. He says, then there is the idea of disposability. It seems to me that disposability is the incarnation of the new possibilities of immaterialism. In other words, the value of an object is not in the object. It is in how people think about it how they got it to you, and what you can do with it. But it isn't a valuable thing anymore. This seems to me a tremendous resource. He was talking about resources for people designing. Disposability, too, gives new meaning to an old, exhausted word, quality. It used to be talked about a great deal in design circles some decades ago. But quality, in the world of disposability, means the quality of being common, not the quality of being exclusive. And finally, disposability puts new vigor into the idea of improvement and change in design. If things are being produced in such great quantities and of such little intrinsic commercial value that it is easy to dispose of them, then variety, change, and alteration can be much more flexible. Now, this is the idea I thought would especially interest you. Finally, and maybe first in order of importance, we have today that possibility which arises with the increase of the very large scale and the very small scale and the dwindling of the middle scale. Der Verlust der Mitte, to borrow a bit out of context a neat German phrase. But a great increase in the size of social functions and social organizations leaves much more freedom for the minutely individual person, the minutely individual family. Within the great impersonality of the world of mass production and total near disposability, there comes clear for the first time the possibility of intense personalism as a proper balance and as a proper enrichment of life. The loss of the middle scale can be one of our greatest victories. Don't you think that's marvelous? Yes, very fine. One thinks immediately of that piece that you wrote for uh, Merce Cunningham, uh, Summer Space, where, uh, which you call Ixion, where the uh, music is all high. There is no middle in the piece at all. For a brief moment, it goes to the um, very low sounds and then back to the high. So that, in a sense, that piece written almost 10 years ago, wasn't it? Yes. Is, uh, is in musical terms, this particular statement. Hmm? And then his... Uh, I've been saying, 
for so many years now that we have quality everywhere, that what we want is not quality, but quantity. I'm not so sure that you would agree with that. Hmm? Well, what is that old saying? God opposes, <laughs> man disposes? Yes. <laughs> we do that anyway. Um, well, I never really saw art, in a sense, in terms of its permanence, because I, for one, can never pin it down. So I was never left the feeling with something very tangible or an object. And recently, I was at the Guggenheim and in a new requisition, they had a, just an absolutely gorgeous Cezanne. He brings the picture plane so dangerously close <laughs> to the eyes that you can't see it anyway. Yeah. It's almost as if you keep the experience, but you dispose of the painting. <laughs> Um, I think a lot of work in the past, at least psychologically, served that dual function. Rauschenberg, I mean, obviously, it's fixed for all time, but it spreads itself out. into the room as well. And even a more uh, conventional painter like Gustin, the wake seems to creep along the walls. Yes. <laughs> you know, though obviously it's been done on a canvas. Um, did you really mean what you said about more quantity and less quality? Well, how did you really mean it? I mean it in several ways. Um, I find that through uh, our experience of, of painting and now music, that everything we experience has, so to speak, quality. So what we would like to do is have, um, uh, to continue to have experience, in other words, quantity to go on having more and more experience, since it all has quality. You follow that? Yes. Then in the other sense, I think our, um, well, remember how a, a, a piece was, um, in the days, for instance, when, when music was on, uh, 78 records, three minutes seemed like a long time. Then when um, LPs came in, uh, 20 to 30 minutes seemed uh, a perfectly reasonable length of time. And now through our uh, concerts, y y you could have several hours and, and it wouldn't seem uh, long. It could go on and on and on and on. And whether we want that uh, quantity or whether, I think it corresponds with, with, um, with how we're living in the sense of um, corresponding like something you don't even think about, like breathing, that our time sense has changed, but that it's involved more and more, not with short periods of time, but with ones that formerly used to be considered long, and so can be, you speak of the word quantity. I just um, saw a play of um, Gertrude Stein with incidental music by Richard Winslow up at Wesleyan University, and it was in um, two parts with an intermission in between. And when the performance stopped altogether, Everyone remained in his seat. No one wanted to leave. They would have been perfectly happy had it gone on and on and on. Of course, this sense of going on and on and on was foreseen perhaps first, or among the first in recent times, by Gertrude Stein. Isn't it also implicit in uh, Finnegan's Wake, 
with the fact that the uh, book ends with its uh, beginning, so that it's, so to speak, endless. Hmm? Now, as far as the word quality goes, in either case of Stein or Joyce, you wouldn't really want to say uh, page 267 is preferable to page 66. Hmm? Well, John, I don't think that Joyce had to worry about quality. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there... But in a sense, I think it's something in a sense... Uh... But through Joyce, through Stein, through modern painting, through our music and so forth, uh, and w everywhere we look is quality. Well, I mean to say walking down a street is now equivalent to reading Finnegan's Wake. Well, I didn't want to use these terms, but what I'm really getting at, which I didn't feel that I would want to get at, was where do we come in? Who, who do you mean? The now? artist. Now, I wouldn't be hurt if you tell me where that do it's we go all out? over. Where do we go? <laughs> where yeah. do we go? Yeah. No, that's better. Where do we go out? Well, now, let's see. Now, I'm not going to... I, I, I mean, we're in a sense, I'm very close to you. I'm, no, we're, I'm we're, extremely no, but I'm we're, as close to you as I'm sitting, no, but as close to you as I'm here this no, afternoon. But, and so I would be the last one to say that I would prefer page six of a certain peace of mind to page eight or page nine. And I wouldn't say that page nine makes the piece uh, or give it its quality. I wouldn't even say that the overall structure or the compositional ideas give it its quality. But again, where do we leave? No, but uh, what you said about the Cezanne just a moment ago, uh, how did you put it? The, the picture was so... Um, uh, it was so, much, so close to you hmm? Yes. that you didn't need it anymore. Now, if you didn't need it, you surely could... No, what, what, what's the position of Cezanne? I guess you still give him um, um, an essential position. Well, he, 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 he made it possible for me to say I don't need it. Yes, he made it possible actually for you not to need him. Hmm? Could you not now? Maybe it's the other way. Maybe I needed him more than I needed the picture. <laughs> <laughs> that may be the case. Uh, now, we we don't want to say where do we come in or where do we go out because we would like, I think, to stay, uh, to not leave, hmm? but to stay here now that we're here. I'm not ready to leave. Exactly. <laughs> so the question is... Um, it's like dying. The question is more, uh, how do we, uh, how do we spend our time? Or do we, do we require... Um, what do we require in order to enjoy ourselves, hmm? In a social sense. Do we want to... We don't just want to enjoy ourselves alone, but we want to enjoy ourselves in society, right? With other people. Well, maybe we can enjoy ourselves alone. I was reading an article, not no. an article, but a remark of Sartre's. He's very annoyed with most men. He prefers the company of women. He said that if he's sitting in a cafe, the man wants to talk shop. He wants to be intellectual. He said that he could do alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, a woman would talk about life. Um, but this, but our conversations, for instance, here, uh, had we been having them, say, 50 years ago, we would probably have been talking about music. Now, they would have been much shorter and had much quality. Yeah. Now, now <laughs> if we now we think, even if we're not talking about music, that somehow it has relevance to music. Crucial. Right. So it's no longer. Um, um, it's a form of enjoyment, actually, to converse. I would say on any subject. One might even describe, as I believe Mead did, uh, civilization in terms of conversation. And he included uh, soliloquy, that is to say, conversation uh, as being possible, one person speaking to himself. I suppose it all boils down to this business of vested interest. I spend so much time getting rid of history 
that to dispose, now I would have to get rid of my own history. Um, when I was in England, I gave a lecture someplace, and a young man got up uh, during the question period, and he said, in reference to Mr. Cage's remark, is everything music, Mr. Felt? And I thought for a moment, and I said, well, I can't speak for Mr. Cage, but uh, maybe I might take the responsibility and add to the remark of his and say, yes, everything is music, but not everyone. Now, but we might be able to break down any type of preconceptions that we might have about music. At the same time, we might be able to break down, of course, the preconceptions or the prerequisites that we would think one, you know, usually thinks of an, an artist as having. At the same time, as I'm leaving, I'm very aware that I could do things that other people can't do. That is, maybe I can leave. <laughs> mm. And it, it, it's not a question of my own survival uh, or my own vested interests. But I think that there is a mistake in thinking. Well, just as, a, just as there was a mistake to think that with the old music or with the older painting, people dug it, people saw it for what it is. And I think that same mistake will happen again on these new times. Unless we reach a state where there is no longer that need for involvement with what we do. Oh. The whole... I, it's amazing, John. It's just amazing how the, the whole... Um, idea of impermanence has even taken hold of, say, in the chic fashion world, where they would make expensive paper dresses mm. in high style. Not that a woman would wear a very expensive permanent dress more than two or three times. <laughs> it's something else. <coughs> I'm not confused about the issue, but I really don't know how to approach it. I mean, we might bring something into the world, it is us that did it. The fact that it might be impermanent seems to be, I can't see it's philosophical and sociological ramification. I would rather see it in a sense more in its religious mm. element. I know that when I write a piece sometimes, I'm telling people, we're not going to be here very long. Well, and the pieces of yours which, on graph paper, which change each time, yes. are there only that instant. Yes, but the model repeats itself in each piece. But differently. Yes. Um, as, for instance, in... Um, certainly there's as much difference between... Um, each performance of one of those works is there is between um, all the mushrooms of a given species. They arise from a, um, a particular um, genetic situation, and each one is different, although they're recognizable. But what, but what we enjoy now is those differences, don't you think? Or do you think you'd enjoy the, um, the non-existent or invisible thing from which these differences come? Hmm? I don't really know where, from where they come. Well, in the case of your graph music, they come from the uh, composition. Yes. Now, do you, the, the question is very simple. Um, do you prefer the composition? Or do you like hearing the music? 
I like hearing the music. Of course. <laughs> and you wouldn't really, uh, you wouldn't really think if someone made a, a serious mistake that anything um, calamitous had taken place any more than I would think if I saw a hybrid among two uh, species of mushrooms that something uh, unforgivable had happened, I would rather be interested. The only difference is, is that if a serious mistake is made in my music by a performer, I attribute it to his character. I don't think you would attribute it to the character of a mushroom. No, but in the course of that um, divergence from your composition, hmm? yes, something would happen which you would notice. Now the question is whether you would be able to notice it as being interesting, or whether you would own, or whether you would not notice it because you were uh, clinging to the composition. Hmm? No, I would notice it as being interesting. I think so. It might even be part of this um, uh, conversation that goes on endlessly, to which you would later reply with another composition. Hmm? either to establish the species more clearly so that those divergences would be infrequent, hmm? or to um, do something so that be divergences would increase. Hmm? Yes, that's my newest piece. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly the piece I'm writing now. This is since the... Uh, uh, what it, uh, tell me what it is. It's a piece for orchestra called In Search of an Orchestration, where it is very loosely controlled in terms of register, in terms of the way the timbre lines up vertically, and it allows for uh, great diversions. <laughs> how, how does the notation go? It's graphic. With numbers? It's with numbers. Um, but not high, middle, and low? Not high, middle, and low. Just the numbers? Just the numbers. Occasionally, I would have an arrow indicating either high or low. Uh-huh. But very, very rarely. Isn't that marvelous? And, the, and it's for a very big orchestra. What about the um, dynamics? Well, the dynamics are still soft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not at loud at all, ever? Not loud at all. You remember, years ago, uh, there were sporadic um, loud sounds. What made them disappear? I think they existed as some form of punctuation. That you felt was no longer necessary? Yes. Really? I think that I was still involved. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But I think I was still involved with some element of differentiation. Mm -hmm. Um... They'd be, though, wouldn't they like the opposite of punctuation? Since by being louder, they would uh, stand out? Exclamation points. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened, John. Maybe I heard too much of its attack. Maybe I didn't hear. Maybe I had some notion about the purity of the sound itself being lost in the loudness of the attack. At any rate, it appeared to you as, as um, unnecessary to the to the rest of the music. Mm. Yes, it also, in a sense, created a certain amount of energy that I felt that I had to uh, use. They became an interference of some kind. Remember in my earlier graph pieces where they would say the woodwinds would be given a long period of time in which to make their entrance, but they would make it to some degree chronologically. Mm -hmm. in time, in this new piece, they begin any place within this structure. Not in the beginning. In other words, he doesn't begin on the beat or off the beat. He can begin at the very end of the structure, which was quite different for me. Mm. Because I was still filling up some type of chronological information. <laughs> But let's get back to that very touching phrase, where do we leave? 
Maybe we need classes like in some religious schools where they remind the children of death every day. So when it comes, they should be prepared. Maybe we need that in our music classes. It's very curious. I was in, when I was in London recently, I spoke at one of the universities and I apparently talked a good deal about uh, death and age and so forth. And one of the students said, um, you didn't used to do this. Is it because you're getting older? You know, maybe the reason that the way you talked earlier about time and how the fact that as it's getting longer, as it's getting sublimely monotonous, to quote a phrase of uh, Robert Lowe's, do you think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we live longer? And we may live much longer than we do now. Yes. Uh, Buckminster Fuller says he will live to be 120. <laughs> uh, Suzuki uh, died at 96. Uh, more and more attention is being paid by uh, physicians to the process of aging, which they say is not necessarily connected with um, degeneration. And um, we may be living to extensive um, ages. I asked a rabbi recently whether he um, thought that Methuselah actually lived to be 900 and something, you know, and he immediately became apologetic for the Bible. Uh, it may be that Methuselah did live uh, that long and that people will be living that long. And I remember a, a lecture where the anthropologist was showing various specimens, various skulls of a certain period, and he pointed out that each skull had its teeth in practically perfect condition. But if you would notice carefully, there'd be a bump on each skull's head, <laughs> some, some rather indentation where he was suddenly hit over the head, you know, <laughs> as he went into the concert hall. <laughs> John, a drastic switch in mood and thought. Why do you think so many well-known composers in America are noticeably silent during this Vietnam? Problem. You mean silent where painters are not? where painters and other intellectuals are not. Well, there are other things that, have, that distinguish uh, music in general from the other arts, but in a university, for instance, <coughs> where I think, by and large, among the art students, you would find a great interest in uh, other fields than art. In the music school, you find the majority concerned with absolutely nothing but scales, harmonies, melodies, rhythms, etc. I think it's because the... Well, you did say composers, but I think musicians in general are not so much involved with ideas as they are just with music. Not only ideas, but life itself. And then if that's the case, the sooner we leave it, <laughs> mm. the better off we'll be. Because that thought did come to me that as we were talking, it started to grow. And there seems to be something absolutely wrong with the hothouse cloistered teaching of music in America. And that conservatism, I think, actually spread to every other important area of their life, and it's very noticeable today. But even the older people are just noticeably absent. This is emphasized, too, by much of the uh, criticism, the program notes for concerts, so far as the... I went to a concert just recently in, across the Ohio from Cincinnati in Kentucky, and um, it included Lee Stuart, who sold out of uh, Stravinsky, and uh, 
work from them. Twenties by uh, Prokofiev. And the notes, uh, the whole situation was as though you were, uh, as though it were culture, as though it had absolutely um, nothing to do with anything but music. Not, not even to do with music now, referring now to the program notes, but that those were just um, uh, historical about the 20s so that one was spending the evening um, touring at a, con at a comfortable distance from the present. And probably a comfortable distance from what really prompted the Histoire de Sodat. Mm. What do you think uh, um, one should do now with reference to the war in Vietnam? Do you think, for instance, that uh, parading with posters and so forth are adding your name to an advertisement in the New York Times or a letter in the New York Times is uh, is an action that will um, accomplish the desire which is to stop that war. Hmm? I see so many names I know and say European protests. I see practically no names I know in the American protest. I was very impressed in an advertisement in the Times put out by a peace group from America getting names of prominent composers and artists you know, in Europe to see, say, for example, Stockhausen's name, Benjamin Britten's name, and then Boulez's name was, and position was used very tellingly in the Algerian crisis. You mean, by tellingly, what do you mean? Did it, it accomplish something? It, it had its impact, ultimately. It helped. It added. Um, you know, my tendency is to think of these activities of protest and of parades and objections and all these things as being like uh, cri critical actions rather than like composing actions. I know in my own case, and certainly in your case, that nothing that the critics said stopped me from composing. Hmm? Now it seems to me that the war is not going to be stopped by uh, critical action or if it is stopped, that it will be succeeded by another war, etc. I think something like a composing action needs to be made, rather than like a critical action, in order to bring about a world where these things to which we clearly and rightfully uh, object will not take place. But I, wouldn't you I agree? Concur, wouldn't you I agree? concur with, with uh, Buckminster Fuller's view that, that rather than objecting to war, we should apply ourselves to, the, to tripling the world's resources and their, their effective usefulness, and that means distribution and, and so forth, so that the world will not be divided as it is now between those who have and those who do not have. He believes that when that design problem is solved, that then, if war takes place, our objections will be rational and effective, as our objections now to slavery are, because through the invention of machines, we no longer have need of, of the muscles of slaves. But if we simply object to war without removing the cause for it, we can expect it to pop up first here, then there, then another place. I think, in fact, that engaging in critical action accumulates virtue for those who object and somehow relieves them of any uh, sense of their having to do something uh, compositional. Now, I... What's going to happen, for instance, when the next... Um, um, presidential election comes along 
Uh, talk with anyone you know about it. No one expects that there that a president will be suggested whom we will truly want, or whom we would think would produce a relation between the United States and the world that we would be um, uh, agreeing with. Should we say immediately that we don't agree and that we will not agree ever? I've thought of a number of things. I've thought of, of um, renouncing citizenship as a gesture. Immediately someone says, well, you'd be more effective if you stay in, the, in this bad situation. But I truly don't see any uh, effective meaning in critical action. And so what's going to happen is that you're going to have your disposal of the creative people in America anyway. <laughs> now it's been what, what do you mean by that? Uh... <laughs> well, if we would actually think back, we would... Uh, I think that what I'm saying is true. The that the creative person in America, especially, has always had a kind of anonymity. You mean that his position aside from the society, or what do you mean? Yes. Yes. Always. Yes. And but that's growing less, I think. I think it will grow more. You do? Yes. I think it'll grow... Um, uh, well, go ahead. And. The reason for this was something which ordinarily I would have considered a virtue. That is his individuality. I think that his insistence on his own individuality in this specific issue points up the tragic floor in the artistic personality in America. I th think that, the is that it's actually simple that being that we cannot uh, identify with any particular type of political stance, mm. we don't know what to do. At the same time, we were always safeguarding this individuality for our art. Now, here's a test where we can use this individuality in protesting the war in Vietnam. And yet, none of this individuality no, I, is used. No, but I would rather uh, use that energy. But one surely could do both, I think. Of course, we can do lots of things. But I think the useful thing to do is going to, uh, to be to further um, world consciousness as opposed to U.S. Con consciousness. And I think that this can be done effectively through support of, um, of Buckminster Fuller's uh, World Resources Inventory and all such ideas, which I find mounting to a vast chorus in the United States and outside of the United States. So that rather than objecting to the activities of the United States to promote the coming into being of world society. Well, the only problem that I can think of in the moment is that it, what you say is utterly realistic in terms of its long-range program and utterly unrealistic for the moment. I, on the contrary, uh, Marty, I think these things are, are um, happening. They are not being delayed. Um, a global village is coming into existence. We have signs of it, uh, not not premonitions, but actual tangible evidences of it over and over and over again. I believe you. I believe that's true. But the White House doesn't know it. Well, the White House has other problems, too. Uh, what is so interesting is that the objectives of politics and economics now in their power... Uh, goals are becoming increasingly difficult to present uh, to a public in, in such a way as to gain enthusiasm for those goals. 
Whereas to present uh, the goals of world society is becoming increasingly easy to present as, a, as something um, which, which gains enthusiasm. Then when you, a uh, simple thing like that um, blackout of a year ago, wasn't it? When uh, we discovered that the, the electricity which we use each day so often is um, connected with the university in Canada. I mean with the electricity in Canada. Why not with the electricity in, in Russia, in China? We know that when it is a global network, that it will be vastly more economical, far more suitable for the uh, larger numbers of people who will be living, that the whole world must shift from its present preoccupation with competition to a world of, of cooperation. And eventually, this that is cooperation... This is happening in the arts as well. Exactly. And that, that cooperation will be um, necessary even from a selfish point of view. <laughs> no more slaves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm reading a book now and picked it up in um, one of the airports called The uh, Worldly Philosophers, History of Economics. On the first pages, you learn something which uh, maybe ought not to have surprised me, but did, that the um, spending your life uh, trying to gain something is a very recent, modern um, way of spending one's life. That formerly one did things without being paid for them, simply because he was born into that situation. Very much as we've spent our lives with music. Something about us, the Lord knows genetically or how, somehow or through some kind of curious set of circumstances we got involved with music, almost as though it weren't our fault, hmm? And we weren't paid for it, hmm? But that didn't disturb us. We continued, hmm? Now it disturbs the young people, well, the young composers. But that, that way of living, that way of doing what it was that one was doing, was characteristic of life in the Middle Ages. And apparently is going to become characteristic again. Whether the man who's writing that history of uh, economics knows McLuhan or not, I don't know, but everything seems to have changed with the um, uh, invention of printing. And you can talk on almost any subject and you find uh, those ideas of McLuhan corroborated over and over again. And in, I, I heard, um, for instance, of great advances now in education where a child uh, just fiddling away on a typewriter uh, has the typewriter speaking back to him, saying uh, gently, uh, try again, <laughs> you made a mistake that time. <laughs> no. So that you have a way of teaching which involves the ears and so forth and which carries the child really back into a situation far more comparable to the Middle Ages than to um, all of the Renaissance education which we had. And this is more and more taken as a matter of course. You don't even have to know anything about music to believe these things. <laughs> I was asked recently in Cincinnati whether I thought that uh, that now a, a student should have a, a um, thorough education in music. Hmm? So I simply said, well, if you were uh, going to um, become an astronaut, Uh, would you uh, spend your time with horses? Brushing them and cleaning out the stables. <laughs>
Do you suppose he didn't know what he was doing? Or knew what he was doing and didn't want anyone to know? I think that he knew what he was doing, but he didn't want to know what he was doing. <laughs> Well, in a very real sense, that's what we're all doing. Um, because even though we might think we knew, the thing will only come to life for someone else when he knows something that we don't know. What were the questions about Varez like that I asked you? I just want, you know, just want to know what, uh, what about Varez. I was thinking about that since the last time we spoke here, especially you remember about changing one's mind. In fact, that seemed to be my dinner conversation for the past three weeks. You remember that Varez his contribution does not seem as important as Vaben because he didn't change our minds as Vaben did. I'm just mentioning it. I don't know if I want to pursue it. <coughs> what about... <clears throat> I, I mean, it doesn't really... has to do with Velez or Vaven, but it has to do with... You may, uh, the way we think in general, yes. and the way we're influenced by other things. Yes. You mentioned, in connection with the loud sounds in, in, your, in some of your early music, that they seem to um, uh, require some, something to be done, had some implications with regard to energy. Yes. How do you relate what seems apparent to me, the um, a fantastic energy in Varese's music with the um, with those vertical structures how do you think about that I wouldn't exactly use the word energy, John. I would say that the whole vertical thinking becomes extremely saturated and then attaches itself to the signals, the motivic element that we hear. I don't think that it was the motivic element that suggested or went along concurrently. It comes out of the structure rather than producing it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So it's like energy escaping and the energy itself is, um, is um, in reservoir. Mm -hmm. Yes, notice that he doesn't get involved with, uh, for example, making um, a very complicated, say, thematic situation. He tries to um, keep it level, even in times of invention. Mm -hmm. That's the way I hear it, at least. And this brings it about that, as in Satie, 
but for other reasons, uh, entirely novel events can take place. that have such have no motivic uh, preparation are not even in the sense of Schoenberg uh, far removed but are re rather simply different I'm thinking of those um, chimes toward the end of ionization it's as though the um, Isn't it as though it must be as though another structure hmm? yes. come into existence? It's interesting. I think you know the cadences of composers are very revealing. Mm. Maybe because they feel that the piece is over, <laughs> or. If they're using, say, a text. I picked up your book on Virgil Thompson the other day in the bookstore, and I read through most of it. You mentioned that about uh, Thompson's music. Yes. How he was, remember, how he was following this particular text concerning an anvil. Was it out of Blake? I don't remember. Yes, the piece called... Um Tiger, Tiger. Yes. And how Verezian. Yes, the first the yes. first version. And there were some remarkable cadences of Purcells, where he does just splendid things, only because the piece has ended or That was always very interesting to me how, on one hand, the detractors of our music would talk about the wonders of absolute music. And then if you would go into the whole literature of absolute music, you find that there's very little of that music that's absolutely absolute. <laughs> how dependent most music is, say, on a literary element. That always struck me true about Boulez's whole career, that the literary element um, seemed to suggest this absolute <laughs> music. Uh, the early piano sonatas, how he was involved, say, with Artaud, Oh, certainly. Mallarmé. And then Mallarmé, or René Char. René Char, yes. And this could be very true, say, of Stravinsky, or many. Oh, and there's an article of Boulez that I've... Um, um, ...referred to sometimes where he, he speaks of all the devices of, of syntax, of punctuation and parentheses and so forth, and the desirability of introducing such practices into music. When did he write that article? Uh, I don't know exactly, but I think it's before um, 54. Then it's before Contacta. I think so. Uh, this closeness to um, Literature also took place in the music of Adolf Weiss, with whom I studied. And his um, rhythm of much of his early music was uh, t taken from, I believe, uh, poetry of Walt Whitman. I find that all over. In fact, an Israeli composer, a serial composer, visited me, and he showed me that his rhythm was based on some medieval Hebrew poetry. Mm -hmm. And just the other day, a student of mine told me that he, I don't know how it came up, but that he heard Della Piccolo at a lecture some years ago in Philadelphia, where Della Piccolo talked mainly about Joyce. 
and its relation to music. So I never really understood what they meant by absolute music. You know something? I think that you're one of the few composers <laughs> <laughs> that absolutely writes absolute music. <laughs> And it seems so theatrical. Hmm? Well, you know what happened when they tried to really write absolute music? You know, it all began to sound like Paganini. <laughs> then they got involved. <laughs> then they got involved with the instrumental devices. I mean, even, say, uh, Beethoven's Grosser Fugue, which is one of his monumental works, is actually an impassioned hymn to God, you know. It's a march. What pieces of yours are they going to play in Cincinnati? Well, shortly they're playing, the La Salle String Quartet's playing my string quartet from 1950. Which reminds me, I, I heard recently in um, Urbana a recording of um, that piece of mine you must remember, Concerto for Prepared Piano and Orchestra. That yes. That was done at Cooper Union yes. once. And was this that performance? No, another performance. They had, they had uh, done it at, with students at the University of Illinois, and they'd spent several months putting it together. Whereas you remember at Cooper Union, it, I think uh, 15 minutes <laughs> taken by the, <laughs> by the um, uh, union musicians and most of those minutes were spent laughing at, at what they were obliged to do. So that the I had never really heard the piece and I, all these years I've thought of it as um, something that I'd avoid hearing. And when I was in Urbana, John Garvey, who had conducted it, spent five days trying to persuade me to come and listen to the recording. Finally, on the fifth day, I had nothing better to do. And I listened to it, and I was surprised. The, um, the, the piece is quite extraordinarily interesting in this sense that it, um, each sound, each thing that happens, is un, um, that nothing, not, nothing that precedes it prepares you uh, for the experience. So that um, I think even if you were not interested, that you would become interested at some point. And a very curious thing happened at the very end of the piece. The audience burst into laughter. At the end? At the very end, but there was no way of knowing that it was the end. Because, you know, the, the third movement has long silences in it. And out of these silences there comes a, um, some sound and then another silence, and then some more sound. And I don't know just what it was that, that um, made them laugh. It may have been something they saw, some, some way of performing on an instrument. But it must have been very strange for them to um, 
laugh and then realized that that they had produced, so to speak, <laughs> the cadence of a situation that, that really didn't have one. John, may I ask you a question? Yes. Why do you continue to compose? Well, I have two pieces to write now because I've been asked to do them. I think that where I, had I not been asked, well, I know that if I had not been asked, I wouldn't write these particular pieces. But having been asked and having said that I would, I will do it. And I'm sure that once I get involved in them, I'll enjoy it. What they will be, I don't know. I mentioned to you the last time we talked that, that uh, about writing for harpsichord. Yes. And that business of the scales and so yes. far. And the more I think of it, the more ridiculous it seems. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I wasn't trying to push you in the corner, you know, by asking that question. Yeah. I mean, I asked it with love. Yeah. Because... No, I, I, I would really be uh, inclined not to write. Because I'll tell you, you know... I mean, a long time ago... I didn't feel that I was making anything. I didn't have that feeling that I was making anything. Consequently, I was very happy. And then now, with the possibilities of hearing my music, it becomes obvious that I made something. Mm. And it has left me very unhappy. And it's as if I'm in a state now where I have this burden, the psychological burden of making something. You know what I mean. Mm. And it, it's a very unhappy burden. But the, that's only the case when you're thinking about it. Uh, when you were talking a little bit earlier about the piece which you're writing now. It didn't sound like a burden at all. It sounded like um, the, um, an experience full of wonder. The way you were talking about the uh, woodwinds, wasn't it? Yes. And the fact that they might come, they might begin it when the structure was completed. Hmm? It didn't sound like you were talking about a burden. When you think about it, then it could be a burden. But when you're doing it, I don't think it is. Well, then let me put it this way, that as you get older, you develop a certain consciousness that you could fall on your face in some way. And I'll put it again another way. Last year, Leon Kirshner asked me to speak to his composition class at Harvard. And when I went in, I looked at them and I said, how many here know how to write a bad piece. <laughs> and nobody knew anymore how to write a bad piece. They didn't know how to write badly. They all knew how to make pieces.
Oh, I suppose what's really troubling me is this thing that I think has come up in all our talks, this whole business of being in the world. This whole business of naming it. Mm -hmm. You have to name it. Mm -hmm. You know that marvelous mm -hmm. myth of Ixion? Mm -hmm. That's why, in a sense, I was aware of that when I wrote Ixion for Summer Space, yes. <laughs> where this man has a very beautiful horse, and he didn't want anybody to steal it. This is one of the myths of Ixion. And so he decided that he wasn't going to give it a name. Zeus saw the horse and stole it. So Ixion ran all over the place looking for the horse, but he couldn't call it, you see. <laughs> it had no name. That's the basis of the story. Ixion got involved in other adventures, but that's the basis of the story. And there was something about not being in the world where what you do is not named. Mm. Uh, it's quite marvelous. It, it reminds me of something that happened recently to uh, students at the University of Cincinnati came to talk with me. They, they're nearly doctors of music. They're graduate students. Uh, Walter Levine of the LaSalle String Quartet told me that they were extremely well schooled and that they had earned the right to enjoy music. Hmm? People have told me, I've just gone to Cincinnati, but they've told me that the city is very conservative and yet everyone I talk to is interested in new ideas. And I didn't know quite what to expect when these two uh, s students came. They're 25 years old. They told me, among other things, that they, the university had access to a fund to um, buy musical scores, and that they had been extremely pleased to get a score from Europe which had a, some novel notation for which there was no explanation. I think of this in relation to your no names. Uh, they were delighted with, the, uh, with being in a situation where they, where they didn't know what they were dealing with and yet could find a way to do it. It's like those, um, the pleasure we obtain now from aquariums, where the fish no longer have Latin names. <laughs> Is this true? Yes. <laughs> Now we can eat them. <laughs> they, they, or we can look at them. Mm. You can't eat a fish with a Latin name. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. All the fish swim together now in one large tank. And the public, uh, the tank is made of glass, and the public walk around and see the fish and, at all the various levels with no explanation of what they're looking at. Formerly, you could read the Latin and then move on. Hmm? <laughs> or you could say, for instance, of a piece of music that that was G-sharp. Hmm? And not hear it. And not hear it. Well, I think this leads us into a very interesting idea.
you know, if a student brings some type of graphic situation to me, and you know, most of them now, the the directions are at least three or four pages of what they can do, what they could do, yes. what they are doing. I always told them that I always felt that it should be implicit in, in the score. Either that or if you're going to have notes of explanation. I think the notes should have um, at least some of the ambiguity of poetry so that one wouldn't know exactly what they meant. In order that reading them, the reader would somehow come to life and be in a position to deal with the music. <laughs> it's a far cry from notation as a as a um, blueprint. and a way of measuring whether something has been done correctly or not. You know, it's interesting in recent years that you read an article in some scholarly magazine finally admitting to the inadequacy of conventional notation. But I always felt that your work was really not involved with creating a new notation, but getting something as close to the action or the experience of how this person should react to the sounds. I, I hope so, um, at least. When I made changes in notation, it hasn't been to it, 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 Well, it's been because I, I was obliged to. Hmm. If it could have been done with the conventional notation, I would have done that. Mm. It is a shame that most musicians think of the conventional uh, notation as the, you know, in terms of language that it became almost like a language thing for them that they were protecting. Yet you would think that the whole idea of music was to present the thing in such a straight and direct way that they then could go ahead and do what they're yes, doing, you know. And so in a sense, in a sense, their whole defense of the notation had nothing to do with making yes. music, but yes. had to do with the notation. Well, there have been so many problems. You remember that interesting one with the, the with, again, this piece of yours that 
that Merce Cunningham used, Ixion, where um, it was written on graph and used numbers, and that was the piece, of course, and that was the way to read it. But the, uh, with, through the exigencies of rehearsals and so forth, I um, translated it into something conventional with quarter notes, you remember, mm -hmm. which was not what the piece was, but which permitted the musicians to quickly play it, where the um, numbers meant that they would have had to devote themselves hmm, in a way that they actually didn't have the time or inclination to do. A similar problem arose with that beautiful piece that Christian Wolf wrote for Rune of Merce Cunningham, where again, the uh, original notation, which of course was the piece and the way to read it, was not the way that it was presented to the uh, musicians, but translated so that they'd be able to do it quickly without giving it too much thought. But times are changing, and um, I think in both cases now that large numbers of musicians would be able to read, to read the notation which you on the one hand wrote and Christian on the other wrote, without that crutch which in each case I gave them. John, do you have any time these days to look at painting I up and a, a, as much as you used to I, well I take time like um, yesterday and the day before I was at Brandeis University and the um, new theater there the Spingold Theater is is right next to the Rose Art Museum where um, William Sykes is curator now and I saw two shows, one of a collection belonging to the museum of paintings. And then downstairs there was, there was a very interesting show of um, photography of the um, American social scene as seen by 12 photographers. I saw some painting, too, in um, Cincinnati recently in a private home. Uh, quite a number of Albers' work and a Picabia. How about the young people? Have you seen any of their work in Cincinnati? Not yet. I'm sure I will, though. And generally, when I go to a university, I, at some point or another, I uh, go through the art department. You know, it's interesting how so many artists today, when they make constructions and such, how they would incorporate sound. And the thought occurred to me recently, would I ever think of incorporating <laughs> structures? Mm. And I wonder why they felt completely relaxed in using sound when I feel completely... <laughs> foreign mm -hmm. from say you know making yes something but in those classes that I had at the new school in the 50s <coughs> which consisted largely of the students uh, making compositions I insisted that they make things that we ourselves could perform in the small room where we were where the class was and one of the first to um, bring something was Alan Caprow 
And he came in with uh, cloth and all sorts of things and objects. In terms of um, of time, performance in time. I mean to say, one could do it and be relaxed about doing it. Did ever enter your head? Oh, I think so. Certainly not as it would enter yours, though. Hmm? <laughs> uh, it'd be marvelous if you do that. Hmm? Beautiful. Let me know when the performance <laughs> is. <laughs> How marvelous. Because, you know, one can very well think of all kinds of structural schemes where you would want what hanging from what and where a sound should be. Beautiful. Other than the conventional right. space that you use. Marvelous. And I was thinking about it. I'll never do it, but... Uh, oh, please do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I did do it, I would have to have somebody help me with it. You know, I can't handle it. Well, that's a... the way things get done nowadays. Uh, you, you can observe that the, when things are done by one person now, they encounter obstacles. But if you get many people working together, the obstacles tend to disappear. Of course, they could crop up in another way, but they would be more apt to disappear. And this would be a way of turning society not into something that would give you a feeling of of uh, burden hmm, with respect to your own work, but would be a way of transforming that whole uh, ogre into um, um, something extremely pleasing. Hmm. In other words, uh, as you were saying, that you have done something now it makes it uh, perfectly practical in this society that what you have to do can be used now you can return the compliment to society hmm, by requiring them to help you hmm, to do what it is that you want done certainly life seems to be leading us there this isolation I was taking talking about this burden, this individuality, now seems to be pointless. I said, seems to be. I wonder if I really believe that. You remember what Bill de Kooning said years and years ago, uh, that tragedy was gone, that the miserable circumstances that someone got into were simply pathetic. I was extremely interested, too, in this uh, <coughs> history of economics that I'm reading now to see that the, the social misery that took place and the large numbers of people who, who um, suffered or were killed in moving from the Middle Ages into the Renaissance through that great social change. Um, this 
we may be in far worse than we've yet seen. And just today, before I came here, something in the atmosphere in New York, I, there was a if it's just in my mind or whether it's in the city, I rather think the two things go together. But there's an atmosphere of um, violence, danger, 